first of all, how did you come to serve in the military and in what branch did you serve? Okay, I was served in the Navy. If you ever saw the movie Top Gun, okay, there was a character in there called Goose. Mm -hmm. That's what I did, okay, in, in the uh, F, primarily in the F-4 Phantom, I was a backseat, you know, uh, what's called a Rio, a radar intercept officer. We'd have called him an RO just because of the old crowd. Uh, how did I get into the Navy? Uh, Kind of, that's probably fair, fairly unique. I love to fly airplanes. I'm one of those type, if I see an airplane flying by, I look up. I still do it, and I own an airplane. I built an airplane, I'm going to go out and work on it after we finish doing this. Uh, I had just gotten my pilot's license in 1974. I was living out in West Texas, a little town of Alpine, Texas. My parents moved there. My father was a dentist, and in 1970, he moved there. I graduated from college in 72, from Texas A&M. And uh, I was, a friend of mine had owned a little Cessna 150, and he told me I could fly the airplane if I would just change the oil and pay for the gas. Now that's fine. Well, I was filling it up one day and it, this one, one, one morning an airplane comes into the pattern to land and it was a Navy T-34, the training airplane, the primary trainer, an old Beechcraft T-34. And as it pulls up to the gas pumps, a guy gets out, I have no idea who it is, and it's, yeah, it's actually a Navy recruiter. And he's talking and we start talking, of course, you can talk about airplanes, and he looks at me and he sees my college ring. And he says, are you a college graduate? I go, yes, I am. And he goes, do you like to fly? I go, yeah. And he goes, you want to go flying in this airplane? Well, of course I do. <laughs> so we went flying around, and that's early spring of 1974. I signed up at his office, and, not, and by June and by August, I was at officer candidate school. So just pure happenstance, you know. It never really crossed my mind to be in the Navy. And then once you start, you just you either quit or not quit. And 22 years later, I retired. Amazing. And so then during that time, how did you guys meet, and when did you guys meet? Did you, uh, have you ever, there's a... <laughs> Pretty famous, well, you can laugh. Pretty famous uh, musical uh, by Roger and Hammerstein called South Pacific. Have you ever seen it or heard it? And if you know, then the, 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 probably the big song is Some Enchanted Evening. Imelda Beck and uh, oh, Nellie. Nellie Forbush, well, they met at the Officers Club. And that's exactly, this is going to be a Friday night in 1977. Uh, it'd be late April. I'd uh, just finished flying, got, cl got cleaned up, and walked into the Officers Club. We were going to, it was the week before my birthday. And there were three of us that had a, had a uh, house. We rented up at uh, the north end of Virginia Beach in, uh, up on Atlantic Avenue in Virginia Beach, you know. And we were just talking about that. I said, you know, to meet some young lady at Virginia Beach was really, it's, it was a target-rich environment for young naval aviators at that time at the north end of Virginia Beach in the summertime. Well, so I, wa I walk into the club, and we walk in, and she, the only time I ever saw her there, I just saw her, I just walked up to her and just said, I uh, just saw the, the real beautiful, mm -hmm. you know, hair. And that's what... She was sitting and talking to a gentleman, and uh, the, I'll let her tell Friend her story. Of my just, father's. <laughs> <laughs> she tell her her part. Like, well, I walked up and invited her to come to this part to a, my birthday party. Okay, but I was also talking to a lot of girls. You know, you, you, you help you help your chances if you talk to more girls. Okay, and I'll let her tell the story why she ends up coming to the party because she, she I didn't even tell her where it was. I just invited her. But I remember I remember you know she was the one I talked to the most that night. But what, at, what he was up in the north end of Virginia Beach with three other, or with two other roommates. One of his roommates was dating my best friend, or one of my very best friends. So the next weekend comes, and I remember hearing about this party, but I remember my friend Ruth also saying, well, you know, my boyfriend's having a party up at their house. Why don't you come by? So she gives me the address. We go up, uh, my old college roommate and I went up to this party up at Virginia Beach. He's there, his roommates are there, he's obnoxious. Well, I might have had a couple of drinks, maybe yeah, one or two, maybe. too many. So, so anyway, I really don't pay much attention to him, but one of his roommates asked for my phone number. And so I give it to him and go home and, you know, get a phone call later in the week and, you know, this guy calls and he's, you know, like, hey, I met you at the party, you wanna go out? And I'm thinking, yeah, I'm thinking it's his roommate. <laughs> But Stacy. Stacy. So what happened was after the party, go ahead. Well, I'd gotten the roommate, the phone number of another girl. And so I, but I wanted her phone number and Stacy wanted the one I had. And I won't use names again because it's being recorded. But I do, we trade, we trade phone numbers. And so I call, I call her up and we go out the first date. We went and saw Annie Hall. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was that. And then yeah. from there on out, we, we were a couple. We got, we met in First went out probably the, toward the end of May in uh, 77, got engaged in October of 77, and got married in February of uh, 78. 
Yeah. And a lot, again, that's when I told Kena, you know, she, she asked about, the, you know, tell my story. So it was really our story, you know, it's because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to right away go, go to sea. And that's one of the reasons we, we were going to get married probably after a year. And as we were just discussing benefits, well, there was no, you know, if I go out to sea and something bad happens and she's a fiance, well, you just go, oh, what's your name? You know, yeah. we're, we're, glad, we're sorry that you lost your fiance, but you get nothing. Yeah. So we pushed the wedding up a little, about seven months. I said, you might as well be covered, which ends up being a pretty good deal because I have a pretty good, I'm part of a pretty bad accident out there on that first cruise. Oh, what accident? Oh, it's, well, if you want sea stories, I can tell you sea <laughs> stories. It was uh, August. Well, first of all. It's actually well, that patch right there. Yeah, the, uh. We need to back up. That, that's what we did. We, we, we went on cruise in uh, March of 1978 on USS Forrestal with the fighter squadron, the F-74. And uh, we're gonna, we honeymoon over there. She comes over. Yeah. We, we tell what you did. You, we, um, we met the ship in Marseille, France. How many girls were, were you, you with? You I and Ruth and? And Robin. Okay. And what we do is we'd meet the guys when the ship pulled into port. And we'd stay with our husbands and obviously we weren't rooming together then. And then when the <laughs> ship would pull out, we would- Hope not. <laughs> <laughs> we would go visit areas and then come back into where the ship would be, find places to stay. So when the guys got there, you know, we each have our own hotel rooms. And, but in the, in the meantime, we'd, you know, just kind of, what they call a seagulls, we'd follow the ship. So we'd go from Marseille, France, we'd go over to Florence, then we'd go into Naples, Italy, which is where the ship was based next. So then, you know, when the ship would pull out, we'd go places and then come back. So uh, we spent about two months and then at the end, or actually about six weeks, and then the last two weeks, he comes back into port and we go up to, to uh, Munich, Germany for two weeks. We took, we took a, our, our honeymoon up there. Yeah. Up in Germany. Up in Germany. And then when that was done, well, we would have honeymooned out to more in, in, in Naples, except my wife one time. Okay, the ship is out at sea. I'll, I'll tell one of these silly sea stories. As you can tell, she's rather fair haired. Well, she decides she and her friends are going to go to the pool and get tanned, right? And, and, and remember, it's, this is dead of summer, like it is outside right now. Well, she, she puts on her bathing suit, goes outside and lays in the sun all day. Well, the ship comes in. Now, you know, and if you've been out at sea for a while, you know, you might want to be romantic with your brand new bride. Well, I get there and I mean, it is the color of this shirt all over her skin. It was pretty much, <laughs> don't touch me. <laughs> so I said, oh, thanks. Appreciate this. If you don't mind, I'm going to go back to the ship for a while. <laughs> you know, so, but anyway, that, so that was the summer of that year. And you, and you asked what really happened. Well, we pulled back after, after getting back from Germany. I, I met the ship back in Spain. And a friend of mine, one of my best friends, a guy named Sammy, and I will use Sammy's name because he and I, you know, he was in our wedding and I was in his wedding, godfather each other's kids. Sammy and I are flying. It's August 17th of 1978. And uh, if you fly off an aircraft carrier, one of the best flights you can ever get because landing at night is always a, shall we say, a, pretty superior experience and we were taking off right before sunset we were going to fly around it was a beautiful full moon night with not a cloud in the sky just what you want to land on okay and we're landing right after sunset well on the last intercept and that's what you do on almost and you out there flying back and forth you always carry live weapons okay well through a switchology problem by the guy we're our, our flight lead he messed up his switches and he shot our airplane out of the sky we're flying around. My call sign is fly, so you might hear. You know, he's a, so we're flying, and next thing we hear, this brake starboard, brake starboard, eject, eject. Guy I'm flying with, Sammy goes, "Hey, fly, is that for us?" And then, the, and the missile hit us in the back. Hits, hits our starboard engine, flips us, us upside down, and uh, we're at twelve thousand feet. And so I had to eject, pull the handle. You know, I didn't. There's no doubt in my mind something was wrong. And we, you know, we both thought we'd had a midair. Somebody says, and we ejected, and. Uh, I mean, it was, you know, it's a great, great sea story there at that point there. Now it's just everything works for your training. You, you go about follow the training you had. You know, you come down, you get in your chute, you get in your raft. Moon, sun goes down, moon comes up, helicopter comes, pick you up, and go back to the ship. And then find out what the story is. In fact, on my Isle of Miwall, uh, I've got the, what's called the pigtail from the missile that shot us down back, back at home on display. But you was asked that, cause that so that's, that's what this patch is. That's uh, from Martin Baker. If you eject, you get a tie and a letter and a patch. Yeah, I could ask if I want to spend five thousand dollars get a watch that says I ejected. I don't want a five thousand dollar watch that says I ejected. But Mark Baker is who made the, the the ejection seat. So so now back to her side of the story again. Now we're newlyweds, and uh, she's she's back in Virginia Beach now. I'm back in Virginia Beach because I'm I'm back home, and. But I'm back. Stacy, the guy that got her phone number, is he he's at this time he's finished up his he, he's he's got a little left in the Navy, but he's not he's not on tour on on the fleet with us now. 
He's not out on cruise because he's getting ready to get out of the Navy. He's the duty officer for the air wing that night when this happens. And back in the day, they, they, uh, they still may have officers' wives clubs or officers' spouses clubs. And the president of the officers' wives club was always the commanding officer of the, of the group. But in this case, the XO's wife decided to call every wife on in our squadron to say that the Forrestal had lost an airplane. And she'd get us more details later. So Stacy then calls and well, said, she, "Well, she doesn't tell. Well, she doesn't tell. But she, well, she basically says, like, Forrest lost an airplane. We don't know who was in it. We don't know if they're alive or dead.' Yeah, yeah. The, we don't know anything more details. Stay so, tuned. So, <laughs> chances one in seventy, it's your husband. Yeah. One in 80. <laughs> so Stacy calls and says, "It was Dave. Let me go in, find out more details." So Stacy goes in, finds out that they're both fine. There, there was no, you know, no mortalities. I, I'm still a wife, not a widow. And uh, so I'm, I'm okay that night. The XO's wife did not call any of the other wives back until the next day to let them know who had actually ejected. So when I go to the next wives club meeting and start telling the story and then said, oh, and when I found out that night that it was Dave, I think every woman wanted to kill me because they didn't know until the next day that it wasn't their husband. And so that was a definite learning experience within the wives clubs of what not to do. You know, you don't call everyone until you have details. And so that was uh, something that actually was written up, you know, because there were so many angry women about that. You know, they didn't know whether their husbands were alive or dead. And you don't know that for 12, 15 hours. And that's not something you deal with well. So like I said, so it looks like it was probably a good decision to get married before that cruise. Yeah. You know, cause it could have turned pretty pretty bad. But I didn't. So like I said, now I got a great sea story. I could, you know, with a few more beers, I can, I can embellish it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I can make it really exciting. But uh, it ended up great. The, uh, and, and those of us that, the gentleman that shot, I, I'll use his name. The, he was an Air Force exchange pilot, a guy named Jim Simons. And Jim has passed away in 85. He, he, uh, he, was, and he was a golden boy, too, because they wouldn't put in a, Air Force Exchange to us. He was former Thunderbird uh, uh, Academy. He was going all the way. He 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 he'd been selected for for uh, astronaut training. And when this happened, of course, his career was over. And he ended up finally getting astronaut training. And he was a, com co a competitive aerobatics pilot. He had his own little aerobatic, and it crashed on him. A control rod broke. 1985. Yeah. He got killed. Yeah. But the re the, re the other three of us that were involved in it. We all we still still talk to each other. Sammy and no, I. They are all still, call each other on the anniversary. Yeah, <laughs> this this August 17th will be the. Uh, 40th anniversary, so we'll call and we'll say, hey, uh, you know. And, Drink and, a beer, we're all still alive. <laughs> <laughs> and, which is rare, just because of the age of 40 years. Yeah. So that, that was that. And then uh, you, you asked some things real quick about, go back to the full career. So I joined in 1974. Okay, first squadron was VF-74 in the East Coast, which is Oceana, Virginia. Uh, from there, we go to uh, be, be a flight instructor in Pensacola, Florida for nearly three years. In those days, a set of flying orders was 30 months, okay? So I get 30 months at Pensacola. And are you familiar with, uh, I don't know, you, you say you're a reservist? I was. Okay. Uh, I became at that time what's called a, what they would now call the term full-time support, what we'd call a TAR officer, okay, TAR, Training Administration of the Reserve. So while I'm a full-timer, my full-time, I keep my reserve commission, I had got two letters right after the, the accident. Uh, one saying you've been augmented, which means you can become regular Navy, or second, you can become a TAR and stay full time, you know, a, a, as a reservist. And uh, talked to all. Of course, you talk to your department heads. I'm a young ensign. You know, what do I do? And they said, Well, do you want to do this for a living, based on an aircraft carrier? Well, not really. You know, and they said, Well, do this, and you, you get to fly, and, and you'll stay, in, so I, and you'll stay full time. So I just did that. So instantly they send me a set of orders to a regular Navy squadron, which is a flight instructor. And from there they called up, I mean, the detailer really crying. They needed people because the Phantom was going away. They'd gone primarily to F-14s, but they had two squadrons in Japan. And uh, this, is, this, this would be uh, probably late summer of 79. Yeah. Because, no, I'm, I'm sorry, 81, 81, because you're pregnant with David. Yeah. And uh, they asked if, I, if I'd go to Japan. And foolishly I said yes, you know. Company says, yeah, yeah, when they ask you, you're going to go. I mean, they, they make sure they play on it. But it, it, it ended up being the, the best three years of our lives, though. So looking yeah. back, you know, at the time, it was the three most miserable, but it was probably the three best. And uh, so I went to Japan to fight a squadron 151 on uh, USS Midway. From there, I went to uh, Naval Air Station Dallas and then to a reserve squadron to fly there and transitioned to the F-14, flew with F-14 a little bit. From there, I went to the Pentagon. 
which made me a real career move because I'm not going to go back to ever do that again. <laughs> you, you do it once and you'll never want to do it again. And, and then I was sent out here as commanding officer of Naval Air Reserve at the, out at Gardner's, the old uh, air station. The Navy kept part of that at the time. It was, we kept about, I'm going to say 20 acres, bunch, about, probably about eight to 10 buildings, and we trained reservists. I was commanding officer of the Air Reserve Center, and we closed. And uh, I was the third to the last and the last because a friend of mine took it over from me, and I, I then, in 1996, I told the, uh, not, actually 95, I, probably a little more than that, but 94, 95, I told the Navy I didn't want to promote to captain, and I did, I just soon retire. They, 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 were, they let me stay out here. I did, because, well, they told me I was going back to D.C., and, uh, and, the head, and the head of the headquarters is in New Orleans. I didn't want to go to New Orleans with two kids, because their kids are in high school. And that was the big thing. Our son was getting ready to start high school, and we decided, well, it's time to retire. You know, this, this is good as any. So I did that, came work here part-time at JCCC, because I'm not going to go sit inside of a, uh, a cubicle <laughs> a cubicle and type. It's just, I, can't. I did it once, and uh, that was enough. So there, there, there's 40, 22 years in two minutes. Yeah. You know. Well, I'm happy that we got to. I'm curious, though. You said Japan was the best three years. Why yeah. the best? I think because it was so lousy. Looking back, it was, it was just pure misery. Okay. The, uh, well, first of all, we've got to back up a little thing. Son is born in November of uh, 81. 81, okay? And we go over there, and we don't know at the time, because he, 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 as I always joke, never get in a hot tub with a bottle of wine while you're skiing. You end up with a baby, because I've got two that way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, we two don't Februarys know. Two February's in a row, two we go skiing. <laughs> two November's in a row, we have kids. <laughs> November 27th, November 29th, you know, so I, th I think it's the wine. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, we... Uh, we went to Japan. We went over there, and uh, I want to say it was you were we were tech, let me back up to how bad you know technology was so different then. You know, just to try to call home, it was a twelve-hour time difference. You know, you got maybe you can find an operator there to get you through to Japan. You know, we we brought the letters. We we wrote each other in the, in, in, when we were in Japan. That's how you communicated. You wrote letters. You didn't email. You didn't you know you couldn't go on Skype. You could, you couldn't stay in touch. So when we were in Japan, it was in the, the uh, Squadron was considered what's called forward deployed on USS Midway. To fly off an aircraft carrier, you have to land on an aircraft carrier every so often to keep your qualifications up. Okay, and so because of that, we were continually deployed. I don't. I think we, we counted up one day. The most I ever stayed in Japan in a year was about 84 days. The rest of the time, we were gone someplace. Okay, so we, we, we were we were gone. We were separated. She's that's why her story. How would you like to have two in diapers living in a foreign country and your husband's not there? It was, it was difficult, um, to say the least. You learned how strong you were by being able to take care of everything. I mean, medical, insurance, how do we do this? How do I take care of the car? How do I register the car? How do I do this? How do I do that? He's out at sea, he's no help. And, you know? and it's in a foreign country, it's in a foreign language. You, know, you yeah. wanna register your car? You gotta what? go into Japan to the Japanese tax office and figure out how much yen you have to pay to do this and uh, so it you just learned you know that everything was more of a challenge over there and you depended more on your squadron mates wives so the women were very close in a squadron in the united states if you were based there the women might work different places might have their own friends because there's other communities out there in japan that's all there was it was the wives of the men who were stationed on the midway or the supporting ships or the squadrons. So everybody was extremely close. Um, for example, one time, oh, one of the other wives hadn't seen me for a couple days. She got worried, she came over to my house. I was sick, both kids were sick. We were just miserable. She grabbed both my kids, two diaper bags, said, you take care of yourselves, I've got your kids. You know, when you feel better, let me know. It, around here, nobody would even notice. You know, it was just one of those things that everybody was so close. You just, it, it was an incredible just experience being with each other. And then when the husbands would come home, the hardest thing was actually letting them take back over because they were gone. Now they want to come back and take care of the bills, take care of the registration of the car, take care of all the little things. So you have to kind of go, okay, that's not the way I would have done it, but okay. You know, and then and he's then gone again two weeks later. And she'll unscrew it a week later when I'm gone. Yeah. 
So he's gone two weeks later, and we go back to doing it my way. So <laughs> for three years, there was the constant in, out, in, out of being home, being gone, being, you know, and there would be times when he'd come home for one day, and it was like, did I dream that? Was he out? Yeah, I guess he was. You know, <laughs> you, you just. I'll tell, I'll tell one story, and I, and I apologize. We'll, we'll use one dirty word in this story, but yeah. she, she knows the story. This was in, uh, this would been 1982, it had been August of 82, and uh, the, uh, we, were state, we lived on the base at Naval Air Station at Sugi, which is part of the Kanto Plain. If, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, everything in Japan. It's uh, probably 20, 15 miles from downtown Tokyo, just due, due west, southwest of Tokyo, and maybe 15 miles east, uh, west of uh, Yokohama. Which is out, out there going toward Mount Fuji, and uh, you had a beautiful view of Mount Fuji right out our front door because yeah. you can see from all there on, on a pretty day. It was a beautiful sight. Well, the uh, one thing in Japan you get you get used to quite common. They have earthquakes. It's, it's just that's the kind of land it is. I mean, you, yeah. you get used to it, you know, things start to shake. You know, and I, I, that's it. Well, the ship had to pull out because uh, we kind of unbe you know, say weather forecasting wasn't as good as it is now. A typhoon, a hurricane was coming. It was supposed to be heading down toward Hong Kong, but it turned up toward Tokyo area. So we had to sortie the shipping because you not, can't have a ship in port during So we're leaving probably about three days early ahead of time. So we're going to fly. The ship is already pulled out of, out of, out of, out of sea. And, uh, you know, the, we're going, I'm going out to the airplane. I've already said goodbye, you know, kiss goodbye. She, she's got David and this is, I, I, I'll, I'll see you. Basically, I'm coming back for uh, when, when, when Jenny's going to be born. I'll be back in, in first part of November. And this is in August. So she, she's out, what, six, seven months pregnant, yeah. whatever it is. And uh, I got to the, toward where the airplanes are and I forgot something. Now, I'm all dressed up in my flight gear. I've got the flight suit, G-suit, the straps on, you know. So I get the driver at the squad and say, hey, take, take me back to the house real quick. I got, if I don't want to forget, I get back in there. Well, I get back in, and by this time now, the wind is blowing pretty good, okay, and the rain is coming down. And I, I walk in, I'm all dressed up and ready to go. I say, I forgot this, I get out there. Well, one last hug and kiss. Well, right as we're saying goodbye, saying goodbye, one of these earthquake hits, and things start to shake. David's little baby, he's, David's what, seven months old? Yeah. He starts to scream. A couple of pictures fall off the wall, and my beautiful bride, who I love, she looks right at me in the face. She goes, "I fucking hate you." <laughs> <laughs> I got a part of like, "Oh, I'll see you in November <laughs> for your due date." <laughs> yeah. So, 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 so you asked what it was, it was tough on. Yeah, you know, that's what I'm saying. It's our story. It's not my story. Yeah, I, I'm not the one. I'm going to go out and be with my friends, flying off an aircraft carrier. It's what I, what I, what I want to do. You know, be out there and, and do the fun stuff. And uh, she's going to be the one sitting at home. <laughs> Getting the, the, getting the the unfun stuff, yeah, and they did that for three years, but also worth it, the uh, some of the things you got to do which you've never done otherwise. She she would go down to the Philippines, and uh, we brought, went down there a uh, couple times. Couple of times she came down once to meet me, once she, she just some friends went down there. We were out at sea. It was when it's winter in Japan. We'll go to the Philippines and go out to a place called Grandy Island. Yeah, rented a house with a couple of the other wives and our and the kids, and we went down there and just enjoyed a couple weeks while the, guy, the guys were gone, so why not? I mean, it was either sit in Japan and watch the snow fall or go down to the Philippines and watch the, the beach. waves on the beach, <laughs> you know? So it was a really tough decision, but we did that. And the availability of space A travel over, in the United, or over there was one of the things that made it available for us to be able to pick up and go very, well, what was it, $10 or something like that, I think you paid. Um, to be able to get on an airplane, but sometimes the airplanes were not exactly what we would have thought of. I do remember taking one flight with David, and I think he had Jenny, or we had Jenny, Jenny with a babysitter. I brought Jenny back yeah. home. And I'm sitting in a cargo net with this in this airplane, and you know there's a big truck in the middle. I don't forget what kind of airplane it was, but we're sitting in cargo nets, you know, C taking, taking the, the flight back from the Philippines like this. The only really kind of interesting thing was all the guys wanted to hold the baby because they had kids at home or, you know, little brothers, little sisters. They missed having the little one. So it was kind of nice. I'd be able to pawn him off on people. And, you know, then at the end of the flight, it was like, where's my son? He's around here somewhere. <laughs> Get him back. And, uh, but, you know, we could do the space A travel and go down and meet the guys. But sometimes, you had to put your name on the list, and you had to know far enough in advance that where you were going, and sit and go down to the terminal each day and say, you know, where am I on the list? Oh, you're up to number 70. Where am I on the list? Oh, you're still on number 70. 
you know, and sometimes a big plane would come in and they'd go, hey, you're number 10. So you knew you could get somewhere. So you couldn't always guarantee you're going somewhere, but if you got the opportunity, it was kind of nice. So, but one time when the ship was coming into uh, Hong Kong, the wives all got commercial tickets and we knew we were meeting the guys because they had been gone for a hundred and... That was, uh, well, you might, you, uh, about Hong Kong, we've been gone yeah. about, about three months. Yeah, they'd been gone about three months. But another time we met the guys in Thailand and that's when they had been we'd gone. Been gone yeah, that we, at the time we had a record for at sea. We pulled out of the Philippines like the De December 27th, December 28th, and we didn't see land again until uh, May. We went to the Indian Ocean and just called us. What they used to do, I don't know if they still do, if you were at sea for 90 days straight, you would get, a, you'd get uh, two beers. They'd give you a beer on the flight deck. Well, we had a six-pack cruise. We, 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 got, we, we got three, three, six, three, three times we had beer. And uh, that's, that's, again, she, she, she brought the letters, but we, we won't get to read them. But it was so funny because communication is so bad. So what you learned to do is you, I don't know, she might be able to show you, you'd number the letter on the outside when it was, when it was there. These are some of the Japan letters. Yeah, these are just some of the letters from Japan. Because and, and this number, was our main communication. And, you know. but, but, you, but you don't know what, you know you don't know how the mail is going to get there. So you might mail it on Monday, then mail one on Tuesday, but the, and Wednesday. But the Wednesday one gets there first. So you want to wait wait around and see if they. So you had to really just number them on the outside so that he knew when you wrote something and said, "Oh, the kids are okay." What happened to them? You know, <laughs> <laughs> or you know whatever else. But sometimes you had to wait, you know, a couple a couple weeks, and then you get five letters. Wait a with Tim out there. Um, that's is that it right there? Yeah. This is well. This is kind of a. Kind or this of was, you know, Daddy wrote a pic, took a uh, postcard and sent it to the kids and said, you know, here's the boat that Daddy's always on when he goes away from you. You know, I love you and miss you a lot. So, you know, things like that that just. This is second uh, of April. This has been 1984, and uh, what happens is, is we're I, I was just just got out of the shower, and uh, walking walking back toward the. Uh, you know, toward, toward the room, because that's what it is on, you know, how it is on the ship, and the sh whole ship shakes. Boom, we hear this click, and then you hear this uh, man overboard, man overboard, then you hear phantom in the water, and uh, of course, instantly, I run back to the room, my room, call the radio room, what's wrong? I said, the rocks, that's our sister squadron, and we're all very close, we still are. They just lost an airplane, and it broke on the catapult shot. And a good, the, the back seater was his first cat shot ever. He, he'd never, he didn't have a carrier call, so he'd never been in an airplane off carrier. Front seat is a very good friend, Tim Murphy, and Tim, uh, he pulls the handle and ejects, but the back seat ejects and he, Tim doesn't make it. His airplane, the airplane rolls over and he skips across the water and gets killed. And so I, I, I say, hey, love, pretty down and uh, in a pretty down mood over Tim Murphy. Uh, it's accidents like this uh, that really show us the unfun side of this profession. Since there's no information in what happened except that something went wrong on the cat, on the cat stroke, I'll not talk about it until we know all what happened for sure. And then I keep talking, and I, I go on to, uh, uh, had a cup of, uh, he go, back again, because I, I, I take a break. Uh, well, back again, uh, in a somewhat better mood. Had a couple of shots with Pope and Tracker down here together, so we're having a drink on the ship. Now, this is against the rules. You don't drink on a ship. Oh, you can't have, look, that's, that's against, so we go on yeah. and on. But th this is the kind of stuff you get. You know, what happened? Uh, hi, David. Hi, Jenny. Daddy misses you both, both of you. You know, this is how you you, uh, you communicated. You wrote letters back and forth. And uh, a friend of ours, I talked about the uh, dance studio. His he he just got recalled. He's he's in the, he's a national guard officer. His unit got just got sent to Afghanistan about two months ago, and he he was engaged. And we we talked them into getting married early. I said, you don't know what's going to happen. Please get married early. And they did. And then I told his bride, I said, send your husband a letter. I said, trust me. An email's nice and all that stuff. Send a letter. Put some perfume on it. Write down what, what your heart's feeling and send it to him. And, and, and then you'll have a history you know, later on. 30 years from now, you'll be glad you do if you're still yeah. together. And anyway, I'm amazed. We talk about uh, of the people in Japan, the crowd, how everybody stayed together. All those husbands and wives. I think we know two people that ended up getting divorced yeah. out of all, all our friends over there. And we're still very close to them. One of, them, uh, one of the guys in the other squad is still on active duty. He's the uh, superintendent of the Naval Academy right now. And we just had a big reunion there uh, last year. And, we, and you say how we still stay in touch with all the guys. I, the other squadrons, I've been in three squadrons, four squadrons. But the only one we stay really in touch with, besides Sammy, the guy I had the accident with, is the guys from BF 151. And we, we stay together. We're very, we're very, very close. But again, it was miserable. So it ended up being the best times because it was the worst of times. And, you know, you know, wouldn't trade it for anything.
and great to see stories. Other, other story, talk about touching the kids. We went up to, uh, in August of 1983, we went up to, uh, we had to do a detachment up in J Misawa, Japan, which is way at the north end of the island. So I get our car, I load our bicycles on the back so we can take them, <laughs> and put the kids in the back, and away we go, driving up the expressway. And it's a toll road. Well, every time you'd stop, the, David, our son, is just blonde as they come. Blonde, I mean, blonde, 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 blonde. And we'd get out, and all the Japanese people want to touch him. And that's what they do. They, 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 they want to see the blonde-headed baby because, you know, Japan is a very ethnically undiverse country. You know, you get there, especially as you get in, you know, in, in, into, the, into the inner part of the way from the Kanto Plain. It's really, so it was really amazing. That, and that was a good trip. It was, a good, it was good for, we rented a house. We we're going to be there for a month. We were fighting uh, the people from Top Gun. They'd come over and use other squadrons airplanes. It was a real good time, except you remember, you don't remember, but you might have read about it. The, the Soviets decided to shoot down an airliner. And that, read KL007, they shoot yeah. down an airliner. Well, we're the closest thing to them, so we go right to strip alert. And uh, we got to, uh, I got to listen to the tapes at the time. And I, okay, I probably still top secret because I know we're spying on them, so I can't <laughs> say too much. But I did call her, and because you know, we had to go to alert, and I told her, she called her at the house, said, I won't be home, be home late tonight. Uh, it really wasn't an accident, I said, when you hear the news. Yeah. <laughs> so I was all like, it really wasn't an accident. And... Uh, so you got you you were right at the at the tip of the spear. You were right at the very leading edge of what was going on, and, and so it was fun. So so again, great stories. You know, they're all they're, get, they're getting a little fuzzy now. You know, as my hair turns gray, the, the stories you know get that way. But uh, it was a, like I say the, the, those years were the height. You know, well, we don't say Vietnam, but it sure was the height of the Cold War. And uh, as you know, close as we probably came to going to war again. Yeah, yeah. Was, was was that year we. Uh, if you, you read, there's a pretty, a guy did a pretty good story, it's called 1983, or did a, his doctoral dissertation, called 1983, The Most Dangerous Year, and he tells, was really interested to read it, and realized that I was, a lot of it is set in the Pacific, and we were right in the middle of it. The, uh, we did a three carrier battle group, you know, uh, snuck up off the coast of, of uh, Vladivostok, in, yeah, totally unannounced, and well, the Soviets were not happy. I mean, you got three aircraft carriers, you know, within 100 miles of your main port, and we started flying, and they went, should we say, well, same thing we would do if they did that to us. And, you know, it really was, was shocking to see that kind of stuff. To say, and then when you read about it, you know, 40 years later, I said, holy cow, you know, it, it was pretty intense. And we just, to us, it was still part of the game. We just go up and do it. Yeah, I can just imagine following orders. Yes. Yeah, well, you, you can't say we're following orders, but it, it was what we did. I mean, that, that, that's, that's what we did. That, that, that was the strategy at the time, and, and the national, you, you, you're, you're military. You, you do whatever the, 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 the planners say to do, we did it. And uh, again, and then she, and she gets all the news four days later in a, mail, in a letter. <laughs> or maybe not. Maybe no letter. <laughs> maybe no letter. <laughs> that's always the hardest part, too, is when you don't hear from them for a while. And, you know, you don't really know what's going on, and... There's always just that, you know, because there isn't the, or there wasn't the instant communication. You know, you could hear things on the news and go, I wonder if he was involved in that at all. Hmm. You know, and then you'd get a letter and find things out. But uh, that was probably the toughest thing. I remember it when the kids were little. We're living in Japan. He's gone. I'd like to call mom to ask about, you know, whatever. Just trying to get a phone call to the United States. First of all, it cost a small fortune to call. Back, back then you had to pay for long distance and you had to pay quite a bit. I want to say a phone call cost like $50 to call back to mom for a few minutes. And uh, so it was, you know, it was really tough. You felt very isolated over there, but, uh, you know, the letters really help. And especially we've saved every one of them. So. Yeah, well, it was the, 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 we have two letters. We, we didn't bring them. They're, they're no, in my yeah. safe. Oh, but we'll tell the story because you okay. talk about being scared. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's, it, and, it, and it's fairly famous. A lot of guys, when we get together, they always want to hear the story. And this is about it. flying with a guy. His call sign is fatal. Okay. And uh, that, that's, that, that's all we need to say. And I can either confirm or deny because I wasn't there. But I heard, uh, if you ever saw the movie Top Gun, the, the scene right at the beginning where the guy turns his wings in. And they, they, they were, people said, oh, that would never happen. And guys said, the, the new me said, yeah, it does happen. It really, really did happen. And, and that's, you know, that, that was actually part, you know. So anyway, we'll, we'll go, to the, go to the story. The, uh, as a backseater, the way, the, one thing the Navy does very well is it crews inexperienced people with experienced people when they would fly. Okay, and that, that's what you, as you'd expect, you know. After, after I've been doing this for three or four years, I've learned a lot. Well, after about five or six years, you've learned a whole lot. Okay, as I mentioned a while ago, the, uh, 
gentleman that's head of the Naval Academy, he has more carrier arrested landings than anybody, over 2,000 landings on the ship. He did the, some of those as an admiral. You know, so again, tremendous experience level. You'd like to ask him what's going on because he knows. Well, we had a, uh, I was the assistant operations officer of the squadron, which means you tell people who flies where, or part of that, uh, doing that, we recommend at least to the CO. And one of the young pilots we had was not very good, okay? So say he was horrific. And he'd been flying with, with another young, uh, I, I thought at the time that I put one of the other guys had been flying, finished up his first tour, let them fly together. Well, he came, the backseater came and said he couldn't fly with it anymore. Well, my job to fly with people, so I'll fly with, you know, that's my job, I'll fly, I'm going to help him. Uh, anyway, he's not, he's really, really bad. So I probably should have done it by looking to his training records, because I've got him. And he had disqualified, which means he could, he, he was at the boat at night twice before he finally qualified. So he was not a very good naval aviator, but we needed phantom people. You know, so we did it. So here, here we go. So now I'm going, I know I'm going to see with the guy and it could be, you know, you don't know what's going to happen out there. So I send two letters. Go and tell the letters you get two in a row. Okay. Two nights, two days in a row. Two days in a row. First one is I get a letter. And I send them registered mail. They're registered mail, which is really unusual. And the one explains that there's going to be a second letter coming and it's got a seal on it and it's registered. I seal it with a wax seal with my ring. Yeah and that if anything should happen while he's out at sea, to take the second letter to the best lawyer I know and sue and sue. Open it in front of the lawyer. Open in front of the lawyer and sue and sue and sue and sue. This is very reassuring when your husband's <laughs> leaving <laughs> out at sea to get this thing that basically is like, you know, if something happens, because he's obviously anticipating it. So the second letter comes and it, gets put away right it's away. It's still in our safe at home. It's never still in our safe at home. Opened. It's never been opened. It's just one of those things that... What, what is it, his training record? Yeah. It was, it was, it, it was letters it, and the training record of the gentleman. Maybe, maybe he shouldn't have been flying off an aircraft carrier. Yeah. You know, so if, so anyway, well, so she gets that. No, she, and she gets... I'm not happy. That, that's the good news. You know, and you got two crying babies <laughs> and a crying husband. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're flying one night and it's uh, called Blue Water. Blue, blue water operation me there's no place else to land except the ship okay that's that's your option because you're too far from land you're about 500 miles away so we're, we're, we come around the first time and uh he gets waved off it means unsafe you know they, they he's, he's not he's not doing it well we come around second time and gets waved off and he's really flailing with the airplane and so we go get some gas go over to the tanker okay and come back again next time he, he bolters he barely touches the, the deck and goes flat which is fine the next time he comes around, he gets another wave off. These are called technique wave offs because he can't land the airplane. Okay, he, I can tell he's really getting scared. He's really upset. So he he comes up. Now it's time to get some more gas. And he goes up, fly. And I call. Hey, fly. Here's what I want to do. Well, okay, fatal. Tell me what you want to do. He goes. I want to go up overhead the ship. I want to climb ten thousand feet. I want to eject. <laughs> you want to what? I want to eject out of the airplane. I can't land the airplane. And I said, Well, I've already done that once in my life. You know. I, I, I've, got, I've got the ejection pack thing. I don't need to ever do that again. So that's a pretty bad idea. Okay. So uh, at this time, we need to get some more gas. And, I, I, and the tanker pilot, uh, Hound Dog McLean, Hound Dog, he's my next door neighbor. He knows me. He goes, Hey, fly, how much gas do you need? So we'll take a little extra here because we've got to talk. So I, I said, Give us this. So we, we take about, normally take about 2,000 pounds of gas. He gives us about 4,000, you know, about, 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 say, 400 gallons of gas. About five, now we got time to fly around a little bit. About this time we get the gas and the ship comes on, on, the, on the radio. Okay, uh, switch box two or whatever it is. Your signal, Charlie, take it, which all means time to land the airplane. Take, turn down wind. And I say, well, we got a little problem here. I'll land in a minute. We got, we got, we got some up here. They, they, they say, okay. So I'm talking to Al. And finally I said, Al, here's the problem. Is you, you, you're listening to the, uh, to the, to, to the to LSO. He's, uh, he's the talking to you. Signal landing officer. signal officer. The guy that, you know, tell, said, which means you're behind the airplane instantly, okay? You're, you're behind the airplane, so I want you to. What I want you to do is turn your radio off. If you uh, if you see rate wave off lights, go to afterburner. If I yell burner, go to afterburner. Other than that, just fly the airplane and land the airplane. Quit listening to the LSO. About this time, he's still, you know, he says, "No, I want to eject." Uh, so I'm saying, "Come on, fatal, you can do this." Here comes the ship. Says, "You know, uh, time to land." I said, "I say we got a problem." Captain of the ship comes on on the radio. Captain says, "Switch." He says, "Your signal is Charlie." I, I, my language gets a little salty, and we will land when I say we're ready to land. Okay, I, you know, I'm in charge here. So eventually I could talk him into it, and sure enough, we, we bolt her one time, and next time he lands. Oh, I'm, I get out, I'm kissing the deck. You know, we get off, we're the last, nobody else we, is it flying anymore. The tanker's out of gas, we, it's, it's us or nobody. Maybe we're, gonna, maybe we're gonna, I don't know what their plan was. So he can't get out of the airplane. He physically cannot get out of the airplane. He's up there shaking like this. 
you know, I get out, go down to maintenance, fill out my thing, walk into the ready room, and there is the air wing commander of the CAG and our CO, and they are livid. What did you tell the captain? He, we have to go for right now. He wants to see you upstairs. And when you go to the captain's, he, let's get right now. And I said, well, oh, sure. About this time, here comes Fatal walking in. It's right out of Top Gun. He shake, pulls his patch off with his wings. He goes, I quit. Fly saved your airplane tonight. <laughs> I, said, I said, let's go talk to the captain. Love to go talk, love to, go talk to him. <laughs> you know, so, so, yeah, yeah, it, it, those kind of things do happen. You know, th so this is why she's getting those letters. But luckily, yeah. he couldn't scare anybody else. He did. He quit that night. That was the last time yeah. he ever flew for the Navy. Yeah. Yeah, so you, and you, so we can neither confirm nor deny, but most people say that story is what the Top Gun yeah, story I, I've was I've been told that, but I can't confirm yeah. it. Yeah, I've never, I couldn't. If yeah. it's not, it, it ought to be. Because yeah. <laughs> as soon as we get together, that's, people always want to hear that story because they know it's true. Yeah, that's incredible. But it's a good news that letter remained closed. It's still sealed, yes. still, still on its way. Sealed. Definitely one that will never get opened. <laughs> you didn't get a patch for that? No. no. <laughs> That definitely should have rated a patch. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's that's one just one more landing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I definitely can see that. It, 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 anybody that flew in the backseat of Navy airplanes, Jeff Fires has got has those stories. Every one of them does. You know, every I guarantee has the same story. I get my friends and they tell you the same kind of stories. You know, because because you're flying with young guys that are scared and you're scared. You know, you just do it anyway. Hmm. Patches. Oh, the patches. They they all tell stories. I imagine we can dive in to a plethora of it. Yeah. Well, most of them are just... Uh, where I was. <laughs> where I was type things, like squadron patches. The, uh, you have, th this is Air Wing 17. That's off the Forrestal. Okay, that, that's just the Air Wing patch. This is fire to squ my first squadron, Fire to Squadron 74 patch. Okay, and uh, there's Fire to Squadron VF-202. That's the last squadron I was in. I, that was that's in the reserves. That's when I was commanding officer of my installation. She took it off, a, off one of my hats, put those patches on the, sh on the thing for me. Uh, and they just, Carrier Wing 5, that's the Midway, that's the guys off in Japan. Uh, Carrier Wing 8, that's the Nimitz. I mentioned, I failed, my very first cruise before I met, now this before I met her was in 1976, I made the first cruise of the USS Nimitz. Brand new ship, brand new ship. And uh, it was uh, really quite, uh, I always, always laugh my, my career, I went from the very newest ship the Navy owned, the Nimitz, to the Forsall, to the oldest, the Midway. You know, so, so maybe they were trying to tell me something about my career path. You know, but and the best operating of all the ships was the Midway because the way, the way it was maintained, it was forward deployed. But the Nimitz was a, f and, and mm -hmm. now it's so funny. They're getting ready to retire the Nimitz. Talking about it, I remember taking the very first cruise. And if you've ever been on a ship before, you know it's kind of rare that you go and everything worked. Turn on the hot water. Hot water works. You know, and you start wrote another one of these quick sea stories on the Forestall. We mentioned talk CAG 17 on the Forestall. Uh, back at the time, it's all men. Okay, at one time you know, I'm taking a shower, and I, I was my, the. The maintenance shop I was in charge of was the uh, fire control radar on the Phantom called the AQ shop. And uh, my, my room was right above that, uh, where I lived on the level of the ship, was right above that shop, okay. And uh, of course the shower is right off my room. Well, I'm taking a shower, and a Navy shower is pretty classic. You get in, you turn the water on, you get all, turn, turn the water off, get soapy, and then you turn the water back on and rinse off. So you don't waste water, because fresh water is, is, is a commodity. Well, the forest hall had trouble making fresh water. So I get in, get all soapy, 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 soapy turn, turn the water on, and you turn it on, and nothing, and you can hear it. You can hear the pipes draining. But you also know if you get low enough, quick enough, you can go find that water, okay? So you get down, go to, from the 03 level, get down to the second deck, there's water down. There's still water in the pipes. So you go run and grab your towel. You, of course, you're naked. Who cares? You're on a ship with all guys, naked and soapy. Go running down the ladder, and there's my shop. And Mr. Swider, Mr. Swider, we got a problem. What? Come in. So here, <laughs> I wish I had a camera, so he got this fat naked guy, you know, with soap all over him, I'm signing a piece of paper. I <laughs> walks in uh, the maintenance officer, he looks and he just, he just keeps walking. <laughs> I don't need to know what's going on here. <laughs> I can just imagine it. Yeah, so, just... yeah, okay, things are normal, we're on the ship. <laughs> so some of the good, good advantages to having females on ships now, you wouldn't have to put up with that stuff at least. <laughs> but uh, so back to the patches, you had that, then you had, uh, the, just, you know, just a phantom patch. That's the ejection patch. That's the one from, uh, hold it up, love. That, that's, this is the one from having to eject off the, uh, out of the thing. Then you go to the front. Oh, and then the one we mentioned before, the tail hook patch. That's, uh, if you read the tail hook 91 stories, you'll, 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 it's in the newspaper. You'll hear, I, actually, I wasn't that tail hook, which is probably to, to my advantage. Yeah. Off the front, 
when you get so many landings, uh, this is the one off the midway. This is the f f midway. So there it is, having 200 landings on the midway. And there's 100 landings on Forestall. I've got about 570 total landings. Uh, maybe I should say I wrote through 570 total landings. On this side, oh, just other things. Phantom patch, call sign with patch from the first Japan squadron. That, that we ha everybody in Japan had that. And you can see we kind of decorated for Japan. I've always kept that because it was a favorite. And then just a few things, a few of the stickers. So stories by all, but mostly, you know, where were you? Where have you been? And uh, th and this jacket, though, the, this this is kind of a unique jacket uh, in that it was part of a. Uh, she replaced it for me. Found one. This was part of a Navy uh, cold weather flying suit that they they quit making about 1970, but found some of these on the forest stall. I took one and uh, eventually wore it out. And we found a company that reproduces them, and so she put it yeah. back together for me, exactly like it was. Yeah. Because he wore it until it wore out. Yeah. So. And, as I was just saying, the friend of ours at the academy, with his 2000, we were a thing, he, then he put, he put his flight jacket on, of course, everybody, eyes like that, as you see 2,000 landing patches, you know, <laughs> patches, he just, it's a walking display of naval aviation. Yeah. Oh, it's definitely beautiful, and I can imagine just the stories that each. Yeah, you just keep doing them, you just keep doing them over and over. So then we, we left from Japan, we went, over, went to Dallas, and then, uh, like I say, went to the Pentagon, uh, and that was just, just a miserable miserable three years. I mean, you, you, miserable and, and unfun. While, while Japan was miserable and you loved it, it was miserable and, and hated it, every second of it. But uh, the uh, interesting thing, again, this one of my, well, she, she, and, she, and, and this one thing, okay, Wendy got her, let me back up a little bit. Let me go back to, to, to early on. What we, cause you said, Wendy, she's in pharmaceutical trials. What, what did you do? What's your education? Uh, I got a degree in biology and was basically just a substitute teacher. But that didn't work real well with being uprooted every two and a half years. You know, it just didn't. So when we were in Pensacola, he encouraged me to go back to school and get a degree as a medical te well, what, what was the technologist. Reason for that, do you remember? The reason for that was because a very good friend of his um, was killed, you know, um, first squadron. Some, some guys I went, through, I went through flight training with, he was a, 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 a six bombardier navigator. And in fact, he and uh, I, I still keep in touch with his widow. Well, she's been since remarried, yeah. but uh, he and Suzanne, they, they were getting orders back down to Pensacola too to be flight instructors. But he was flying around an aircraft carrier at night in the A6 and just disappeared. Never, 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 the, the airplane crashed in the water someplace. And his wife, Suzanne, in fact, Suzanne, uh, I helped her pack up when she, they went, she went out to KU here to pick up her second, second degree out of KU and helped her. I knew nothing about Kansas at the time. She left, she left there, but she had a degree and she, so she, she worked outside the house. The wife, the widow of the guy that was the pilot of the airplane, didn't was was a uh, you know raising kids at home. That, that's when I said you know you need something to do in case something. I've already had one of these bad things happen. It could happen again, and so she got a we I got sent a, her back to school in Pensacola to get to be a medical technologist. Yeah, I got a degree in medical technology, and that's been very portable. So wherever we've gone, I've been able to pick up and get a job. You know, be it Dallas, be it D.C., even in Japan, I worked part time at the hospital down there. So you know, it was something to do outside of the house when when you've got two kids running around and you sometimes just need to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely imagine. So you were mentioning about your kids. So that was right at the beginning of your guys' marriage? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, we married. We got married in 78. David's born in 81. Mm -hmm. And Jenny's born in 82. So David was born in Portsmouth Naval Hospital in Virginia. And Jenny was born in Japan a year later. So <laughs> again, that February trip uh, yeah don't do, don't go skiing yeah but uh, that, that was the trip heading out that way <laughs> if, if, if you want to hear the, the differences in I always laugh about medical care from military people complain now Portsmouth Naval Hospital is, is near Norfolk which is the biggest Navy base in the world okay it is truly a baby mill okay how many babies were born the day David was born do you remember no three three normally yeah. they pack put out 30 a day yeah okay so David's born in fact they had we, we go over there he's born the day after Thanksgiving and there was nobody in there. was there. nobody there, and they kept, I mean, there were nurses and everybody else coming in all the time, you know, and I'm like, oh, okay, whatever, you know. <laughs> but that, that's the way normal normally is, you know, there. You, you're having a kid, well, it hurts too bad, you know. <laughs> we, we got 40 of it, so they taking care of her, pamper her hand over foot, okay. Oh, yeah. So she's the only patient having a baby that day, you know, that during that time frame. Now let's go to Japan a year later, okay. Not quite the same. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry, anesthesia is not on call during the night. Suck it up, sweetie. 
<laughs> so the, 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 now we're having a baby at, at the other end of military medicine. <laughs> And the Japanese culture, too, I, I, I'm lay, I'm, I walk by, there's some lady in labor, and she's laying, it looks like a, a slab. And I, I, that, that's what it looks yeah. like. I'm going, you got to be kidding me. And nobody in there with her, and that's just the way she's going to have it her It was baby. a joint hospital. It was a joint mili uh, Japanese military and U.S. military hospital. And maybe that's why I was always so close to my, to my I'm so close to Jenny, because uh, she's, you know, she's having the baby, and when they hook up to this monitor, and one of those, when it shows a big contraction, and then she starts saying, the doctor just checked her out. She said, the baby's coming, the baby's coming. And I said, what do you mean the baby? The doctor was just here. She said, I'm telling you, the baby's coming. I look down, and there's a baby right there. <laughs> so I go running to get the nurse. I said, would you the doctor? And by the time I get there, I've got Jenny in my hands. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the doctor said, I said, I'm, she knew, she just had one of these, so she knew, knew what was going on. Yeah, <laughs> and can trust you, can, me. I asked that, can you unhook her? You know. <laughs> I remember the nurse saying, were you stir? Like, oh, obviously not. And I caught her. I was here to catch her. <laughs> so, so, again, that's why, again, why, oh, so close so my daughter. You know, when, you, when you deliver them, you catch them. You yeah. Know? But uh, so that, that, that was uh, yeah. just the difference in stories between, you know, two, two different types of hospitals and the yeah. busyness of it. And, and just a year apart, too. Yeah, just a year apart. <laughs> <laughs> not recommended. It wasn't planned. <laughs> so, but but uh, so we went up to D.C. and... Uh, it was, it was good. You, one of these stories, if, I always wondered when I was in, uh, oh, back when we go back to uh, 19, the mid 80s, uh, and there was the Iran Contra scandal you, re you read about, and how Colonel Oliver North, the Lieutenant Colonel at the time, that's why I retired as 05, how he did some things. I was well, how can a Lieutenant Colonel get to have, have this much horsepower? You know, you know it's strange to me. Well, here we are in the, uh, this was in the 1990, uh, a, a, in the Iraq War, uh, uh, was it 90, War? You know, probably right. For, you know, but uh, when we when when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and uh, anyway, I was uh, Saddam at, right after they invaded, because I guess nobody really knew what was going on. The uh, Pentagon sets up a watch station, you know, and they take a, one, a friend of mine, an 06. My job at the Pentagon was I was in charge of all the Navy full-time support enlisted their, their careers. Okay, so and he, this friend of mine, he was in charge of all the uh, cryptologists. You know, well, so he has you know. Clearances. He, he he speaks above the presidential level, you know. So they put him on watch station, and uh, a beautiful Friday afternoon. I never forget. People are going home already, and I'm sitting there pushing papers two in the afternoon. And my phone rings, and uh, again the uh, phone rings, and I pick it up. I you know, op one thirty two Commander Swider. He goes, Hey, Dave. Called him by my real name because he doesn't know my call sign. And he says, "This is you know, this is I won't use his name." He says, "Yeah, what you got?" And he goes, "Do we need six seventy three B?" This is the authority to recall reservists, Title 10, Section 673B, okay? And I know what it is because that's my specialty. So I said, well, we might, you know, I don't, you know, I'm not really worried about it. We're three days into this, you know, this war thing going on, you know, after the invasion. He goes, well, I need an answer. What do you need an answer for? He goes, well, we're going to Colon in five minutes. It's General Powell. And General Powell's going to the president with a recommendation. I said, what? He goes, well, I need to know an answer. So I say, well, how quick is it? I got to have it in five minutes. So I look up and it's a beautiful Friday afternoon. Two admirals in their offices, they're empty. I look for my captain, not there. So what do I do? As a good officer, I go to my first senior chief, an E8, senior, get over here. Because <laughs> he, 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 he and I were together. So we start talking. Do we need 673B? How many do we need? And so we make up whatever, like 20,000. We just make it, we're going to recall 20,000 people. Okay. I, we just make this up right there. We'll need all of our medical people, all our supply types, all of our cargo handlers, all of our CBs. So we make this up, two of us talking on the phone to the guy, and he, that's what they do. And I, next Monday, we send out the recall letter. There, there was a decision process to do Title 10, 6, and 3 p for reservists. My name went on the, on the message, and I get this call from a doctor crying about, he says, I can't be recalled, dot, 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 dot. Yeah, I can't be recalled. And, uh, I said, what's what wrong? He said, well, I'm only in the reserves. I use the money to pay for my boat. This is what he tells me. <laughs> I said, well, Doc, I'm going to put you on the biggest boat you ever saw. When it was all over, he called me back and thanked me. He got put on, he got put on the comfort. He got, you only get to do this for your country one time. But yeah, I, I, I'm going to put you on the boat. <laughs> you know, so. That call, that decision, that <laughs> But that, that, that's the decision level to recall people and, and change their lives. <laughs> Quite a few hey, lives, just 20,000 that you yeah, guys sell. It makes you feel better, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, my goodness. I'm still imagining just getting that letter. Yeah. <laughs> saying, and it's happening. Um, so 
a little bit more about both of you. Are you both from Kansas, or where are you guys born? Where is your mm. family? No. Nope. We have, this was just kind of the, wh where the wagon stopped. Mm. Um, I was actually born in Pennsylvania, but grew up in Virginia Beach, which was the home of Master Jet Base, and was always told to stay away from the Navy boys and stuff, and so I married one. Uh, but, but growing up in Virginia Beach was interesting, especially when we were talking about, you know, like Vietnam War, um, everybody's dad or brother or whatever was involved in the military in one way or another. Um, one of my very best friend's father was killed over in Vietnam. You know, um, one time I'm walking through the mall actually with a girl who kind of introduced us. Um, her dad was a Vietnam helicopter pilot, a medevac, and we're going through Pembroke Mall. The Marine Light Colonel. Marine Light Colonel. Um, and we're walking through the mall. He's home on leave from, and there's this loud bang. And he grabs his wife, his daughter, and me throws us on the ground in the middle of the mall and pounces on top of us. And I'm laying on the ground kind of going, Ruth, what is your dad doing? You know, just kind of, and then we had people coming up, helping us up going, how long have you been back? You know, wanting to know how long he had been back because that was just instinct for him, was a loud bang, was something was coming in. And so, you know, that's, that was basically in Virginia Beach, very common. People recognized that right away that, you know, he was, he was back. This was his instinct to do that, and you know it was uh, it was just interesting. But yeah, I was told to stay away from the guys, but you know, oh well, it didn't listen well. And, and I was I grew up in the Gulf Coast of Texas. I grew up in a little town of Richmond, which is near Houston, Texas. Uh, my father was a of course World War II veteran. Uh, as a dentist down there, and I was accepted to dental school, and I just, I just couldn't do that either. You know, just one of these things that uh, it didn't ha have a whole lot of interest to in me. But we went to uh, I went to Texas A&M, graduated in 72, and by this time my parents moved out to West Texas. My father was a dentist out there, and that's where I joined the Navy from, was out there. But, uh, no, I, you know, we, we, we got ordered out here to be the, and again, the kids were starting high school, and, you know, the wagon like they just broke here, and then there was no reason not to stay here. She, her career was starting, and she was where she was, and I said, well, we'll just support you for a while, and I yeah. said, I don't, I don't need to work full-time, so that's why I work part-time yeah. for the school. Yeah, for 18 yeah. years I worked two years here, two years here, three years here, two years here. And it was, uh, you know, I did it because that's what we were doing. We were moving every couple of years. But when we got here, I got a very interesting job and I really liked it. And so I kind of said, you know, for 18 years, we've done what you've done. So let's spend a few years doing what I want to do. So. And now Kansas is home. Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. And being a good husband, I just say yes to. <laughs> and yeah, I get 49% of every vote. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so <laughs> At least the forty nine percent, yes. I get forty nine percent. And that's why forty one years together. <laughs> <laughs> that's the secret right there. Forty nine percent. Forty nine percent. And yeah. yes, dear. Yeah. <laughs> um, you mentioned that you that I imagine that was a shock being thrown to the ground. Yeah. And having that experience. How did for both of you the Vietnam War affect you guys as a whole? What experiences, what reflections? Uh, Go ahead. Well for me the uh, I was Anybody my age remembers uh, December of 1969, okay, because it was a draft lottery. I was number 321, okay. Uh, one thing I know when, when people talk politics, they say, oh, he didn't, you know, he got a draft deferment, this and that. I want to look around and say, we all did. If you could, you did. Okay, pretty straightforward. I, you know, I, I, that, that's not something to hold against somebody. I mean, if you, didn't put, if you weren't putting your hand up, you know, I guess I was taught, you know, either enlist or resist. You know, that, that was the story back then. The, uh, if, 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 you're, if you're in that, that, era, I mean, it was, uh, as we said, 1968 was a very contentious year, you know, it, and it doesn't get any better. I mean, it, it keeps going downhill from there for quite a while until we get, till we get out, you know. By 1974, when, I'm, when I joined the Navy, when I'm in there, the, uh, of course, the war was still, we were still involved, but we weren't, you know, we, 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 we hadn't evacuated Saigon yet, but uh, all my instructors were Vietnam vets. We were, were combat veterans. And it really, how does it affect you? One thing, you stu to study hard, you're watching these guys who just finished, you know, getting shot at in service of their country, they're getting kicked out. I mean, we, it's called a RIF, a reduction in forces. So you're watching them unload people right and left while they're taking me in brand new. And you go, well, this doesn't make, seem to make sense, you know, but I guess, you know, pe smarter people smarter than me are making those decisions at the Pentagon. Until I got to the Pentagon and realized that people smarter than me weren't making those decisions. <laughs> it was people like me. Okay, so, uh, but no, the war itself, uh, I mean, it's so, it's so hard to describe just how contentious it was. Uh, I mean, 
er, early on, I remember we just had, we talked about the high school reunion, but talking, I remember when I was a sophomore in high school in 1965, and we were talking about, do you think it'll still be going on by the time we get out, get out of high school? And people, no, nah, there's no way, this can't be keep going on. Of course, then it keeps going on and keeps going on. And I, you go to that wall, and anybody my age group has friends on that wall. Yeah. I mean, you, mm -hmm. most people, but I'll go up there, and you know, I see Ricky and Malin, I'll see their names on there. And you go, you know, and now I want, well, you kind of, what for? You know, in fact, I got, we were there this last time, this, uh, we go to D.C. When I was there, I couldn't stay in D.C. Now I love to go visit. And of course, I can't go up there without going to see the, visit the, the, the memorial. And, uh, but there were some people there that walked around and one, one guy says, yeah, sure were a lot of wasted lives. And I said, every one of these was, I mean, in, in the big picture, there's 58,000 names that, you know, looking back, why? And I know you probably talk to people here, you know, they, they're all going to have different things, but, you know, and uh, they're also, be, they're all proud of their service as well. They should be, but I think some of them feel betrayed. I know I'll go on, we'll go some places, go to cruises on a cruise someplace. I'll always have a veterans get mm -hmm. together. And to, the Vietnam vets are very, you know, you might get to have a few Korean vets, a few that are left, but the Vietnam vets, for the thing, they, they feel they were really let down by their, by, by their government. Okay, not so much people, you know, you know they, they, they talk about the medical problems they have right now. They're not getting help, they, you know, and those things. And they're very, very, you know, uh, as I say, hurt. You know, they, they, they were dragged, dragged away forcefully. You know, it's called a draft. Okay, they, they didn't sign up and they were forced to do that. And, and then they then to not be treated as well, probably as well as they should have been treated, you know. So yeah, it was very contentious. Very contentious where I was. I mean, even in, in deep, d deep darkest, you know, red Texas, it was you know, why are we doing this? You know, what's going on? And by 1970, I think everybody realized that well, we probably shouldn't be doing it anymore. You know, I joined the Navy after it was, after it was, we still had people over there. The one thing that did affect us, we we were picking up even on the midway. You'd pick up people, you know, the boat people. It'd be people leave, you know, leaving Vietnam and you stop and they'd be on a boat and you pick them up because people are trying to get out of that part of the world. And that went on for quite a while after the, after the war. But it, uh, yeah, it's not fun to talk about. It really isn't. I mean, it's, it's uh, you know, to, to watch people get drafted. You know, until, until, until you've sat there and had that fear over you, you know, we were all watching that, uh, I remember that draft Television. lottery. Yeah. Good, good friend of mine in college, he was draft lottery number two. He was drafted. Got lucky. He went to Germany. You know, he didn't have to go to Vietnam. Yeah. Just, just, just out of pure luck. And uh, I got lucky, I got number 321. Yeah. And I'm sure that if I'd have gotten a low draft number, I'd have enlisted in the Navy. Because you could, you could, you know, a lot of people, you know, if you volunteer for the Navy or the Air Force, you didn't go get, have to go be a ground pounder. And with almost a college degree, they would have taken you right away. Definitely. It's interesting, though, how it's something that resonates with everyone mm -hmm. and will for a very long time. But it's interesting how you say, that for you, that people in your age group you mentioned have someone that they know. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. You, you can't oh, not. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it's guys just, I dated in high school. Yeah, at least one of them is on the wall. And I imagine yeah. that you guys have family, friends. You know, it, it goes on. Yeah. It just you know, it's it happened. It was 50 years ago, 40 years ago. You know, we we, we talked about it. 50 years ago it was 68. Was, was it was 68. But uh, you know, I can't say it is what it is. But it's it's what the you know, leadership decided to do it. And like you said. You salute and say yes, sir. You people, people forgetting in 1966, it was not unpopular. You know, it, it, was, it was a very popular thing. It's going it's to be 60, 68 and on once the music get the Vietnam. In fact, I get a little upset. We we love dinner theater or theater and uh, musicals, and there's a real nice kind of cabaret downtown that we like to go to. And they were doing music from the 60s, you know, and they put. And I, uh, as I tell them, how can you not have some of the world's best protest music on it? it you know. You, you, you can't not do it. How can you not have, you know, Glenn, Glenn Galveston, one of the best anti-war songs ever, ever written, but, you know, and, and a big hit song in, in the late 60s. And, you know, you can't, you can't talk about the 60s and not talk about Vietnam. And two things, the Vietnam and the space program, for heaven's sakes, they were real big those years. Yeah. I mean, let's don't talk all about the Beach Boys. <laughs> I'm sorry, but there were some big things going on back then. And like I said, in 68, uh, orbiting the moon saved it all, you know, as perspective of class of 68. You know, you had you had you had to have gone through there. You had you had to know the feeling of uh, when Bobby gets murdered. You know uh, how people really felt because of that, and it was a real shock. I can imagine hearing it on the news for the first time. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. And even though you know the TV wasn't as good, and you know it's still when the news flash came up about you know Martin Luther King being killed, 
um, you know, the unrest that occurred just, you know, what's going to happen? Are, are there going to be riots? You know, who, what, when, where? You know, Bobby, um, just the, you know, not knowing, everybody's on edge. There's just that little bit of unhappiness on edge. You know, my younger brother was also, you know, we all sat at the television, what number is he going to get? You know, because there was always anger in my family with, you know, my father was, a, uh, he was in the Merchant Marine in World War II, you know, and he's like, you know, my son's going to serve, you know, and my mother's like, he's going to Canada, you know. <laughs> so there was a few fights in our house. Thankfully, his draft number was very low, and we didn't have to worry about that, but, you know. Actually, very high. Very high, very high number. I'm sorry, very high number. It was low on the list of getting called, and uh, so, you know, it affected everybody. Your family, how, how they felt about politics, how they felt about everything. Uh, at school, you know, like I said, there was a guy that I dated that went to Vietnam and didn't come back, you know, obviously a lot before I met him, but um, you know, <laughs> it really, and growing up in Virginia Beach, especially with the military community there between Norfolk, Virginia Beach, um, Langley over at Newport News, it was a very heavy military community. And most of the time, you know, it was like, yeah, 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 yeah. And then it was like, we're tired of this. And you could see it with, with everybody, with the military community. Of course, these guys are flying and they're having fun, but it's like, do we really want to go over there and fight? You know, so, and like I said, one of my very best friends in high school, her dad was killed over in Vietnam while we were in high school. And it was just, you know, it kind of brought everything home. You know. East, East Coast sailors, though, the, 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 the war was fought on the West Coast. The for, forest all deployed, of course, you had the forest all fall, fire in 1967. Yeah. And that was deployed out of Virginia Beach. And the uh, people that got killed on that uh, were most of the people that died. The majority were the night check crew for VF-74, my squadron. They were asleep. They were in their birthing spaces, which was when the fire broke out, and it trapped them inside there. And they couldn't, yeah, so the majority of, those, of the 100 and something, 178, were just asleep. You know, they, they'd gone to bed and were trapped inside. The, uh, and so, that, again, all the forest all sailors, you know, if you were on the forest all, you couldn't walk from Hangar Bay 1 to Hangar Bay 2. You saw those names up there, and you, and you realize their memories of it. But uh, east, for the East Coast primarily, and you saw that the Navy, there was a big thing. The, the West Coast was where the war was fought from. Okay, yeah. so it was Miramar. You know, you, yeah. the, the Miramar people, were they, and, and they, they'd hang it over your head, too. You know, oh, you're an East Coast sailor. You know, you're not, you're not, you're not over here fighting with us. In fact, I've, I've had, I had CEOs that were, uh, yeah. you know, they were, they were Vietnam vets, and they, even today, they'll, they'll hold it over the people that didn't go over there, same time frame. You know, they, they, you know I got shot at, you didn't. And it's really kind of amazing. Yeah, it's <laughs> definitely know? an interesting perspective yeah. Yeah. on their end. <laughs> yeah. But, huh. Amazing, absolutely amazing, and I know we can continue diving in, and we will continue to dive in. It sounds like, obviously, your time in service shaped both of you mm -hmm. and I imagine that it shaped your children as well looking back how do you feel overall how do you how do you say that it impacted both of you maybe <laughs> this was one thing I always, I always one thing you go to a show someplace one thing I, for me is I don't like uh Okay, okay, we'll go out, go out to Branson, Missouri. If I go into to a show at Branson, Missouri, what's going to happen? They're going to play their song. That, anyway, some lousy guy playing a fiddle, okay? And it might be the world's lousiest show, okay? But I guarantee he's going to get a standing ovation at the end because what he's going to do, he's going to say, let's have the veterans stand All up. All the veterans And so they go arming it, and they all, pretty everybody standing up and clapping, okay? And that's and the end show. You know, every show. And she always has to make me stand up. I don't want to stand up, okay? I don't want to stand up for this kind of stuff. We just went up to... to uh, Oh, it was the last year flew up to flew the airplane up to Rapid City to go up to see uh, Mount Rushmore. Yes. And at night they do the same thing. They they have a flag ceremony. They want all the veterans to come down. And yeah. she's pushing me down the step. You know, yeah, it's just one of the things. I, I don't I don't need the fact you know that uh, when somebody tells me I'll, I'll go into a, a uh, oh, say a Home Depot, because I didn't do it for years, but she makes me you know they give you ten percent off if you're a veteran. Okay, and if I buy something big, I'll I'll pull out my ID card and say would you and what do they always say? Thank you for your service. Okay, and. I don't try to be mean, but I really what, what, what I th and I really do mean. I said, no, nah, really, I thank you. I've got the world's best life. I, I, you know, got a great retirement, great medical. You know, I'm in the most 
protected class there is, if you have to look at it. I'm an old, white, male, retired Navy officer. Okay, there is no more privileged class in this country. Okay, I walk on, on Veterans Day, there, somebody's gonna buy me, buy me supper. Okay, they will, I mean, I go, go any store, I have, have lunch, I have this, and you know, it almost makes me feel, I, 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 I don't wanna say I'm not a veteran, but I sure don't want to brag about it. I, I don't, that's just me. You know, now I love telling sea stories, but, but but when you say thank thank you for your service, oh, oh, okay. I mean somebody did it, and I get paid for it. I get I get, I get a tremendous deal. You know, yeah. I get people, people complain all the time. I had to laugh. One of the military, of course, I'm an old man now. I get to, I get to use uh, Medicare, but when I first got Tricare, okay, it went for Tricare. Now this is real quick. Tricare Prime. Okay, this is what you paid for insurance. I paid for her and me and. I, $12 copay, that's all I ever paid, was 450 bucks a year. That's a year, okay? It got raised to 485, and you'd think every veteran I know thought, you know, that the, the, the socialist communists had taken over and stolen their houses by paying 30 bucks more a year. I said, you ought to be thanking your lucky stars and thank these people that they're taking care of you, you know? So that's what I do. I said, thank, thank you guys for taking care of me. You know, now that I'm old, you know, I, I, I got through and I get to see stories and I can drink a beer and tell silly sea stories. <laughs> You know? and then and, the stories and, get a little bit more and they get a little better and the kids I, I think we got out when they were in high school they, they probably have very little memory of our military time i mean we moved i, I, I would think so because yeah. uh by the time they're starting we were in of course they're born in japan they didn't know anything they're going to grade school in uh they're toddlers and then grade school in texas and then grade school in dc they're you know uh we get out here junior at, high but I'm really, by this time, it's not really military. I mean, I'm the commanding officer of installation, but it's not like, you know, I'm getting up every day to go fly a jet someplace. I'm getting up, putting on my uniform, going to work. You know, it's like any other eight, nine to five job, you know. And uh, then when I retire, of course, or I get out, you know, by this time, now they're in high school. So I would bet if you ask them, they might have a little memory of living in D.C., no memory of Japan. Yeah. You know, may, maybe a little bitty bit of living in Texas, but, but that, that's about it. I know when we moved here, our son was real upset because he had his friends in, uh, you know, he was in thir what, third grade? Yeah. He was in third grade. Oh, I can't leave my friends in third no, grade. You, you'll make new friends, trust me, you know. Yeah. And he was very upset leaving DC, the D.C. area. But I would bet you if I ask him, do you remember Hardy or Melissa, his two friends? He, you know, he, how many eight-year-olds remember their best friends from eight year, when they're eight years old? He's 38 now. Yeah. So I, de I doubt he's, wor he's too worried about it. So I, I don't think it had a whole lot of... Just because yeah. when, when, when we were on active duty, they were very little. And by the time we got out here, the active duty out here was just, you know, it was a job. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you go run the show. It's like any other executive job, you mm -hmm. know. It really wasn't the military as far as they're concerned. Yeah. And I'd like to say that I push him to be recognized as a veteran. You know, I'm the one that's making him stand up and making him go down. Because for so many years, I don't think the veterans got the, uh, res the respect and the recognition that you see nowadays. And I think it's very important to, to push it so that it does continue. Uh, I mean, I remember Vietnam veterans coming back and, you know, being, you know, just shunned. And, you know, you didn't, it was like, oh man, you were over there, you were killing babies. Um, they weren't respected. And so now that it's more PC, to have the veterans be recognized, to say thank you to the veterans. I think it's very important to continue that and make him stand up and be recognized because it was a lot of, sir. I mean, it was a tremendous uh, sacrifice to the family. You know, when he's home 83 days a year, you know, he might've been having a good time out on the ship, but it wasn't so much, you know. <laughs> but there were those moments that I think it does need to be recognized. And I think that finally, Finally, veterans are getting more of the recognition that they do deserve. So, I make him, yeah. And I do, I stand up, but I'm not happy about it. <laughs> but as I said, I go, yes, dear, and with 49% of the vote, I then stand up. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's the secret to marriage again. <laughs> it's just amazing though that, I can definitely tell that you guys are a team. That everything and anything of both your time and service, and the time before you met him, mm -hmm. and now after, as retired, that you two, you are the team, you are the service, well, you are. If nothing else, we've always been best friends. Mm -hmm. Always been yes. best friends. Yeah. You know, they, they just, you know, it's, that's, 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 that's the secret, that's the secret. 
you know, be friends. You know, you, you, know, you, you, you can be lovers, you can be this, but be, but be, be friends. You know, yeah, you, yeah, you know, you're going to get mad at each other for once in a while, but for, really, we don't have very many arguments because I'm always right. <laughs> Forty-eight percent of the time. Yeah, it's going down. <laughs> <laughs> that number's going down. My God, I'm losing even worse than I thought. <laughs> uh, but you know, the he he will make comments every once in a while about how much he respected the time when we were in Japan, that he was gone, I was raising the kids, you know, taking care of everything so that he didn't have to worry about that while he was out at sea. His job at sea was to be the, in the military. My job was to make sure everything at home was taken care of. And those couple of years that I did it, it was almost three full years. Yes. Yeah, we, we were there. I was supposed to leave in July of... Uh, 84. 84, but because there was nobody to replace me, because again, there was no more, there was no, the, the F-4 had died out. They weren't training anybody, so they kept extending and extending and extending, okay? And I just couldn't, again, go back to, I was, the, by this time, I'm the, administ the admin officer of the ship for my squadron, and uh, there was some report due out, okay? And I wasn't going to do it, because it was a waste of time. And I remember my executive officer getting, real, this is in the ready room, he comes up and he yells, he goes, fly, you might be the best F F4 back seers ever. Da, 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 da. But you only get one grade in airmanship, and the rest is all these officer stuff. And I looked and I said, Exo, that one grade in airmanship is why I'm out here right now. And that's why I'm here. And that's what we do. For, that's, what, that, that's what's important, is flying these airplanes. And I'm not going to do your stupid report. <laughs> I got to read about it later on a fitness report, but who cares? <laughs> Nobody liked him anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But uh, you know, just real quick, some of the, some of the she stories she doesn't tell them. The uh, this house in Japan. Okay, I look back up a little bit. So this this, this little bitty bear, they, 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 they were base built probably, but, base house probably built early fifties. But uh, you go down. It was upset. There was what three three or four. four it was a four, townhouses. Five, townhouses. Four ta four townhomes in, in, in a unit. But uh, you'd go inside at night, and think you'd look at the kitchen floor. You swear it was moving, and it was. It was roaches. Oh, by the tens of a thousands. thousands. <laughs> These little bit, you turn the light on. <laughs> and if they spray, they come spray your house. Well, they'd spray your house, but they just move next door. <coughs> so they'd spray and they'd go next door. So two days later, you, at night, you know, there's, there's the room moving at night. You're going, holy cow. Dealing with that for him gone for three years. Yeah. You know, or, or and the, it didn't she, get any better. She sends me the picture. She's in one time and our son goes, gets in a can of Crisco. She's got a picture of him on the floor. He gets in the, uh, the kitchen floor, and he's got this Crisco all over <laughs> him. And he is also taken, and his little sister, who's just a baby, and just covered her in Crisco, and he's sliding her across the kitchen floor. <laughs> to make it easier to slide, he took all the eggs in the refrigerator and threw them on the ground. And I didn't get a letter that night. I got one the next night. <laughs> Yeah, I imagine the time to wipe off the Crisco <laughs> do you took know just a little bit. Yeah, it's tough to get Crisco off a baby's skin so, without scalding so them. So you ask why do you become best friends and get loyal? That's because <laughs> so I put up with that stuff. <laughs> yeah, you put up with this crap, you know. I mean, it really is the truth. You put up with it, you know, and uh, all, the, all the wives and husbands over there put up with it and say, and say good friends. Yeah. We all say, and, uh, and I couldn't tell. We just had the, a reunion of the people from VF-74, yeah. my first squadron. Hey, how you doing? Good to see you. Bye. If it had been VF 151, we'd have been sitting there for hours, hours, hours on end. In yeah. fact, one of the guys that was in this VF 74 was in VF 151 with us, and we spent the whole time talking to him at this at this reunion. He and his wife, he and Joe and Jeannie. Yeah. Because we're still just that good of friends. We were that good there, and we're still that good. And uh, in fact, he was the one. I won't use any names, but uh, go back again. Sea stories. 1988. Uh, we're going to shoot down. The Navy shoots down two Syrian airplanes. Two fitter bees out of the Gulf of Sidra, and uh, and uh, somehow the tape of it makes CNN. CNN, yeah. Okay, and that night we're watching we're watching the news, and they said, and we shot down two airplanes, dot, 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 and they start playing the tape. We have these tapes talking about what do 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 do. They talk to. Next thing you hear, this uh, a missile goes. Uh, a guy goes Fox One, which means they're shooting a missile, and I hear this voice go, Oh Jesus! And I turn right to her. That's beads. That's <laughs> friend of mine. He's the pilot of the airplane. He didn't shoot the missile. His backseater did. <laughs> and I, I, right there, I said, that's beads right there. I've flown with him too many. We've been in two squadrons together. I know him real well. It, Just he, from two words on a TV. You know, he's like. <laughs> <laughs> and it was. You know, we, we, we'll tell the story now. Yeah. yeah. 
But that's, guess, yeah, that's how small the military is in, in some aspects, is you just know so many at, at least in those communities, yeah. in, mm -hmm. in, in a fighter community. Yeah. You know, back in, especially in the F4 community, it turned into a real incestuous little group back in those days. There was very few. The last F4 flew off the midway in March of 1986. Uh, Alan Colgrove and, uh, oh, just a second, oh, Ichabod. Ichabod, oh, yeah. Blanket ship. Right. I mean, these, they, they fly the last Navy Phantom away, okay, off the ship. And it was a good, it was, that's how small it was. We all knew each other by that time. You've got 24 airplanes and uh, maybe 40 people flying them. And the funny thing is, you know, he, he's like, you know, Ichabod and so-and-so. Everybody's got a call, call sign. sign. We had people that actually didn't show up at our wedding because they didn't know his name <laughs> because he was fly. They, called, they said Dave Swider. Who's Dave? Yeah. <laughs> Lieutenant J.G. David J. Joseph Swiden. It's like, do we know that guy? Fly. Last name is Swida. Most often mispronounced Swada. So he's Fly Swada. Okay, so. <laughs> <laughs> Terry Murphy stuck that on me, a guy named, when I was first went to training. Terry died in a car wreck yeah. in, in, in Italy, drinking too much. <laughs> <laughs> Typical naval aviator. <laughs> Out of all the odds and how. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know you just shared this, but if you don't mind sharing it again, we were discussing how the time while he was away impacted your children while you were there and the letters that you wrote. So if you don't mind sharing that again. Well, what I, while the guys were gone, the letters would be very nice because you could always pick one up, reread it. Sometimes Dave would actually, um, you know, m send postcards to the kids, and I could then take it and show, you know, hey, this is what Daddy's doing. Um, but the letters that he could write, he was always on the ship, and he was always flying and. So there wasn't a whole lot of new news in the letters that he would send to me. You know, it, there were the personal I love you's and things like that. And, oh, we're probably going to go. It's, it's Groundhog Day on the ship. It, yeah, it's Groundhog Day. Whereas when I was able to send letters to him, it was a little bit more newsy. And most of it was uh, based around what were the kids doing and what kind of trouble were they getting into. So there were a lot of times pictures of his son covered in mud, you know, and pushing his sister down face first in the mud and, you know, the sliding of the Crisco and the fact that from the time that David discovered that he could climb the refrigerator door and get into the eggs, we couldn't keep eggs in the house anymore because as soon as we'd buy eggs, they were on the floor. He had, could climb, throw them all over the place, scoot around in it. So I found out that you could actually crack eggs, put them into ice cube trays, freeze them, and then we could have eggs whenever we needed them without him skidding across the floor in there. But, uh, you know, it, it was difficult having Daddy gone. And, uh, you know, we had the letters. Um, occasionally we had some videotapes where we did videotape some things and uh, send them back and forth. This is, this is the early days of VHS, okay? And I'm talking about a video record, you know, the camera. It's one of these things, you know, you lug it around the ship. <laughs> and we still got, Fritz of us did some very good videos. We've got those, you know, we did. But that's what I would do is take a video, walk around the ship, and then send it back back to them, you know. Yeah. Maybe the big sit, cassette sit, tape, you know. Sit, sit in a VHS, sit in my room, take, take, you know, this is for you. Take, maybe, you know, do Itsy Bitsy Spider and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, just so they see that Daddy does exist, you know, he's not this... Uh, yeah. Being, because like I said, when when we when I get back from one of the, one of these cruisers, the kids are getting older each time. That's that's where you really tell the difference. I mean, you're gone for three four months, a kid changes. I don't change, but a kid, especially that age, is really growing up. Yeah, yeah. Five month old, all of a sudden a nine month old, or he was gone for almost five months, and he comes back, and you know, our daughter is afraid of him, because she's been raised on the base with a bunch of other women, a bunch of other kids. And all of a sudden, this big, hairy guy who wants to throw her around in the air and stuff like that shows up. And she's like, Who, what is this? You know, I don't want any part of it. But, uh, you know, so it, it's tough on him. He comes home wanting to hug and love on his kids. And she's like, you know, keep me away from you. So. Um, and now she just wants money. So I wish it was back <laughs> like the old days. <laughs> so that, yeah, that's true. But, uh, you know, it, it just was... Uh, you know, here's this here's this guy that comes into your life and leaves, and comes into your life and leaves, and comes into your life and leaves, and 
and uh, even things like the potty training. Okay, I've got a little boy and I'm needing to potty train him. Well, I can't show him how he needs to go potty. It just isn't physically possible. And unfortunately, because we're on the base and the guys are out at sea, there's no men around to do this. So he finally comes home and I'm like, you gotta do it, you gotta show him how to. And miraculously, we get potty trained. But there were things that, you know, that never crossed my mind that I couldn't potty train a boy without daddy being around. So uh, there, there were the challenges that you hadn't even thought about, you know, with the, with the kids. So I guess the, the biggest challenge was Jenny, the daughter, would not go to sleep at night. Would not go to sleep at night. It was so to get her to sleep, we put her in the car, put her in a car seat, and go driving around. Driving around Japan. <laughs> Japan. Just drive. It, the only hard part about that was in Japan, probably every night there's a firework display. Yeah. <laughs> so you drive. Boom, boom, and they say, wait, would you, would you please, 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 I just want my daughter to sleep tonight. You know? I don't know how she did it when I wasn't there, but we would, I, I would say three nights, three out of five nights, maybe five, out, four out of uh, a week, we'd go driving around outside just so she'd go to sleep. She was just, she was a colicky baby, and she just was not happy. That, that movement helped soothe her. And you'd be driving around, the fireworks would go off, you'd keep driving around a little bit more. You know, you finally, okay, she's asleep. You pull the car in very gently. You pick her up out of her car seat. You walk in, have somebody else help you at the door. You lay her down in her crib, and she goes, ah! You know. <laughs> so I need a drink, that's why I'm an alcoholic, man. <laughs> So the, it was just. But again, and you asked that earlier on. You said, "See, the kids don't remember, won't remember any of this, okay? Because they were babies." Again, so they they remember me being a football coach for them here, or, or, in, or in up up there yeah. in uh, in D, when we were at DC. You know, I, we coach youth football there. We were very active with the club here for twenty years, and so they remember those things. But they won't, you know. The, the, so they remember just being mommy and daddy. Yeah, uh, that's their memories. But our memories were raising them overseas and. Uh, you know, I joined a Japanese dance group while we lived over in Japan, and uh, we danced in what are, were called the Bonadori festivals, where I had the full kimono and had to pull the hair up, and we went from little town to little town dancing in the festivals, and one of the festivals was at our base, and he's got the kids because I'm dancing, and they're all in their cute little costumes, and what was it? You gave David a sip of beer, and he took the beer and took off. <laughs> you know, and people were all laughing. and. Yeah. The, uh, you know, you asked earlier on, you know, why, uh, oh, it was about, about uh, I was talking about, about how, how I act now toward the military. In December of this year, I will have been out of the Navy as long as I was in. I've been retired as long as I was in. Okay, so it's really a long time ago. I retired in October of 96. Halloween Day, 96 was my last day. I was free to go trick or treat. So yeah. in, in December of this year, I'll have been out 22 for the exact same amount. So that, that, that's why it's, it's, it's kind of just, Going back in the past more and more, you know the uh, I, I look. I, I can always I can look at pay stubs and stuff. I've already received more in retirement than I ever made on active duty. You know, so it's a uh, so it's like, thanks a lot, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. But uh, yeah, so, so that, that's why it's going further and further. And you know, I, I I don't get too excited about you know the thank you this, thank you that. You know, that was a long time ago. It really was. You know the uh, all, all I'm sure y'all talked to all the Vietnam vets. It really was a long time ago. You know the, uh, and because I'm I'm more of a I was a Cold War vet, and again I don't I don't bring politics in very much. But you know I didn't in 1983 I didn't like the Russians. You know, I trained to shoot them. And they they were trained to shoot me, and I get a little concerned now. They're not my they weren't my friends then. I, I don't think they're my friends. I really don't think they're my friends now. But uh, you know that's just me. Maybe I always, maybe I should be able to outgrow that, but uh, probably never will. You know the, 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 those people. We we I've been I've been to South Korea. She she's been over there with me. You know, it's, it's uh, the North Koreans were not my friends. Okay, I, I, I remember them trying, you know, when they'd send airplanes out to intercept us, you know, and they, you, we'd, be, we'd be told, they, they'd be, they're arming up, we, we can tell what they're being told by their ground controllers, you know. So they weren't my friends, I don't like them now. Well, sorry. <laughs> and I'll go to my grave that way, I'm sure. Yeah. You know, because I, I, the best years of my adult life were trained to fight those people. You said you went to South Korea. Mm -hmm. yes. What yes. was that like? Oh, fun, 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 yeah. fun, 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 fun. Good shopping. <laughs> We did, that's what we did over there. You talk about okay, tennis shoes. It, we probably bought a set of shoes. For, I bet you, to the kids were eight years old. We never bought a set of shoes 
in the States because we buy them. You buy, buy a size 8, 9, <laughs> 10, 11, 12. Ship them, ship, ship them back. <laughs> we ship, we ship them back. Yes. I bet you we, we were probably in D.C. before we had to buy a new set of shoes in the U.S. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great shopping over there. Fabulous shopping. Oh, I, I, like, I like Korea. We, yeah. That was a, uh, uh, we, we, we went there quite often. The, uh, uh, again, another quick sea story. Okay, because they're full of them. Uh, when you're overseas, when we were over there at the time, if the enlisted, if, if you wanted to take leave, okay, uh, the commanding officer could, could could approve leave if it was in Japan, okay, because that's home, or, or going back to the states. If it was if it was above that, it had to go to the air wing commander. Had that that's that's the next thing, the the, 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 the air wing commander. Well, I get this. Uh, we're pulling into Pusan, Korea. And the uh, see the red light district there is, is uh, Green Street. And that's the the red light district. And what bars red light district? Well, I get this leave request from one of my sailors, and for the address he's with, he puts on there again. Pardon my language. Whorehouse Green Street. Well, I, you know, it's kind of tough to say yes to this. He goes, well, I don't know which one. I'll let you know later. Okay, okay. Well, I can put, put up with that. So I approve it, and I take it to my. Commanding officer, and he goes, we're, I don't know where he's going to say. He said he'd get in touch. I trust him. Okay. So, you know, we take the air wing commander. There's CAG, and he looks and he goes, Are you serious? I'm dead serious. Okay. This is what he wants. So he gets it approved. I said, No, you got to let me know. Well, first night in, we go into town. Now, you got first night in overseas back in the days, we always had to be in our white uniforms, okay, to the Navy. And you go out with the troops the first night. You always have a beer, and, you know, a little socialized. So we're sitting there in a bar, Green Street, and I'm talking to this. Next thing I hear this, Mr. Swider, Mr. Swider. I look up, and there, oh, 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 on this rail, the guy, he's got two young ladies with him. He goes, this will be the place right here. <laughs> okay, I know where it is now. <laughs> and his leave was approved. <laughs> so, so and I, we I, had the address. Now I know how to get in touch with you if I need to. <laughs> so, again, those things, I heard those kind of things happen. I can either confirm or deny those either. I heard they happened. <laughs> Yeah, but, but uh, no, no. Korea, we did a lot of flying there. Uh, good place, good place to visit. Great place, you know. It was a uh, go go to the there was a air base at Osan, the port at Pusan, and uh, we also did a uh, oh that was with a rework facility. We take our airplanes there to get fixed, do major repair over there. So we did that at Kim Hay. And of course, you loved the shopping. Yes. I loved the shopping. It was. Uh, there was a lot of shopping to be done in Korea. It was just one of the places where you could just pick up all sorts of things. They had lots and lots of tailors, lots and lots of shoe plaque, shoe factories, uh, leathers, brass. We bought our daughter a brass bed. He had to haul it onto the ship to bring it home. <laughs> a lot of things like that. She's, she mentioned once she was coming to Hong Kong. Well, she, she brought the children. David's second birthday and Jenny's first birthday is in Hong Kong at Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah. And, uh, of course, she's traveling with the kids. One of Jenny's in diapers at the time. Yeah. Well, she doesn't want to carry the diapers, so the ship's going to go to Hong Kong. Well, what's a better place to carry them is for me to carry them. So here I'm walking. I go to the exchange, or the commissary, rather, and I'm buying these baby diapers. We're in the Philippines. Okay, and the ship is going to go from the Philippines to Hong Kong. Well, I'm walking on the ship. It's kind of strange. They're questioning me. I've got a s boxes of baby diapers in my hands, and I'm walking onto an aircraft carrier. And <laughs> I shall say the, the, the officer of the deck, was, oh, he, he, I know he wanted to ask a question, but, but he, I think he was too embarrassed to even actually ask the question. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but uh, we did that, and that was, uh, I always laughed. That trip there ended up being, I'm a very avid golfer. Okay, I still am. And uh, I've got a great video it's on YouTube. We actually had a golf tournament at sea one day we're in, in the Ocean. We're hitting golf balls out into the, one of those beer days. We're playing golf on the carrier. and not, she, she sent me. I sent him a little golf a mat, pad, one of those know. green grass yeah, things, you so, know, so, so, we, we had, so they we, could hit golf balls. Yeah, we'd get all dressed up in our golf outfit and we'd play golf. But uh, I'd always made it one of my best friends there. We played golf every time we went into port. Okay, one thing. Well, the first time we hadn't hit Hong Kong in a while, we're going to play golf there. Remember, I've got a wife and two babies coming there. Well, she's not going to be real happy that I'm playing golf on the first day in port, right? Oh, the second day in port. So I said, look, I go, I'm going to go play golf. I'll babysit the next day. You can go shopping and buy anything you want. The most expensive golf round I've ever played. I've got this beautiful set of rosewood furniture in my uh, dining room still, probably about $5,000. <laughs> <laughs> she goes to the Navy uh, Federal right. Credit Union there because she's on, I think, gets a line of credit. And, and then went shopping. I said, I, you could buy anything you want. I and did. 
<laughs> and I still got it, you know. And I and, and I missed a putt on 18 to lose the match too. So <laughs> that was probably the worst part of the day. But uh, yeah, so, so I got to put, and I took care of the kids. and She went shopping. It was yeah. a good deal. And now it's still with you today. It is. It is. <laughs> and it's I got a, the story. It's a reminder of his bad golf. <laughs> yeah, and bad timing. Yeah, bad timing. <laughs> You know, not the first day in port. You know, that was the biggest thing was, you know, he could have put it off t a little later, but bad timing. So I can imagine. Yeah. But again, friendship. Yeah. Exactly. And stories. Teamwork. Yes. <laughs> oh, somebody's in there. Sorry. I just, I get distracted sometimes when I hear yeah. somebody else in the corner. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then you've done... An amazing amount of travel. Yes. Yes. Your best to your worst. Oh, our official honeymoon would have been in Munich, and uh, then we, from there we went out to Berchtesgaden, which is back back in those days you can't do it anymore. The uh, at, at, in the height of the Cold War, we kept lots of lots and lots of G army in Germany, and they had what was called the Armed Forces Resort Centers. You could stay in a hotel at, in uh, Munich. And uh, there were Munich, Berchtesgaden, uh, oh, what's down, uh, another, another place in Bavaria, I'll think of it in a second, but they, you know, just beautiful places that were very inexpensive. You just make your, if you were in, the, in there, you could, in fact, at the time, anybody could go, a retiree could go, I could go right, you know, from the U.S. to get over there. That's all gone now. They just had the one in, uh, in Munich. But, uh, so we went there, we, she, we, we traveled up to, uh, went to Rome, and spent her birthday yeah. in Rome. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, I took the train up into Munich and then spent a week, week and a half touring Bavaria. I mean, mm -hmm. go, go, so that, you know, hard to beat that. You're honeymooners, no kids, you know, and, yeah. uh, you know, it, what, what, beautiful scenery, beautiful wife. I mean, what, what, what else do you want? You know, I think I bought you some ski boots there and a sewing machine. I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how's, how's that for a romantic buy? A sewing machine, shipping home. And then, uh, boy, in, 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 in the Far East, it, for me, probably, I'd say, boy, I like Pattaya, Thailand. Oh, Thailand was fun. Uh, yeah. Actually, the Philippines. One of my favorite places in the world, the Philippines. You know, just the really? people. The, uh, they just had the Philippine... Uh, the Fiesta. Fiesta over here in town. We went to it just because I, I, I like the Filipino people. You know, the... Uh, the food. The food, the, the people, the friendliness. The, uh, that was it, it just... It's a beautiful, it was a beautiful country. They like the American sailors. Now, it's... Uh, it is again. It's a typical, like any port. It's a port city. Okay, I mean that you, you, you go into into, into to, uh, Subic Bay, and I don't know if you ever gone on a cruise ship. You go to cru on cruises. Well, I, I would say every cruise port is the same. It's full of hookers and hajos. Okay, that's what a cruise port is. Okay, I mean they're trying to sell you something. And all the, well, you, Subic Bay and Alangapo is just that kind of unwritten rule at the time. Was and she came down. Yeah, you know, but but the wives, you know, don't go out in, into the Sin City, into Alangapo at night. Okay, that, that's all, that's off limits for a wife at night. Okay, because lots of sailors there. I mean, the, lot, lots of things, the people there. We don't. But she, we're during the day. So one day, again, she has the kids down, and we're gonna go uh, do some furniture shopping. Okay, down at that place, at the very end of the, of the main drag, Magsaysay Street, a place called Anna Ong's. Yeah. And we go. So put David in a stroller. I mean, David's a little blonde kid. Jenny. So they, Jenny's only like three months old at the time, yeah. two or three months, brand new. She, she, she's down there. And I'm walking in that. Well, there was a one place with our squad and the officers always hung out, a place called the UNI Club. We called it Norris. And it was, you know, th 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 it was nice because Nora said, these guys are all married. You know, they're here to have, you know, you, you can be very friendly, keep your hands off. You know, they'll buy you a beer and they'll play, they'll play the, you know, the dice games with you. But, you know, there's, there's no hanky panky here. And they understood that with, with the, but it was you know, very friendly. Just a place to go have a beer and unwind. So we're walking across, and I still don't want her to, to hang out with these people. So we're walking, and I go on the side of the street opposite Norris, and, and I'm push, pushing the, 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 the stroller. Do, 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 do. At wait, warp wait. speed. At warp <laughs> speed. Now i got to get back, though. We're coming back, and push, push back. Next thing I hear this, fly, fly. And I keep walking, fly, fly. Wham. She goes, your friends are calling you. <laughs> So now I've got these, shall we say, they're escort type ladies, you know, and they're over there. <laughs> we go, and again now, blonde, blonde baby in the Philippines, doesn't exist. And everybody they want, wants. And here comes Nora, the owner, she goes, only if Fly says you can touch the baby. I said, sure, you can hold the kid, yeah. take, get a picture taken. But, uh, you know, so the Philippines, one of my favorite. Either just, just, and in Japan, all over Japan, all of Japan was fabulous. <coughs> I mean, just the people were friendly. 
the uh, yeah. Yeah, we, the trip up to uh, Misawa, we yeah. went and ride, riding our bikes around Lake Tawada. You know, we just, just, you know, just an example of why you like Japan. When we first moved there, we could not get base housing. Okay, so we had to live on the economy for a while. Yeah. Again, you want you want to really, really, really build loyalty? Here she's three months, four months pregnant. So going through all the sickness of pregnancy, has a baby, has, has a five month, a, a six, six month old, and she's living in a, on the economy by herself. Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm out at sea. She's living in a foreign country, not even on the base. Yeah. You know, and all of her neighbors are little Japanese ladies. You want to heat? You want to put water in the water for the water heater? You get hot water? You get kerosene. You carry five hot, gallon cans of kerosene. kerosene and pour in the in the in the. And that's how you get hot water. Okay, because what you know that's that's what they use the kerosene heaters. And uh, we're over there. Oh, I lost my train. Because <laughs> I can tell you a dozen things, but. Uh, the time that I hoisted the kerosene and yeah, she, she, she I didn't off. get the spout on correctly, and I hoisted up. I'm very pregnant, trying to fill the kerosene, and the ker whole five gallons pours all over me. Can't even go in and to my house to take a shower because I have no hot water because I just spilled the kerosene all over myself. The, I uh, love him. <laughs> <laughs> but you want to pay your bills over there. This is very unique. Okay, this is this is this is the uh, society. There, this here, here's the difference of. Uh, of societal norms she could either try to find out where they go to the elect play electricity play gas you know play those things try to find those places or they come around they all come around the same day of the month the the, the people that the, and pay your bill what you do is just leave your money on your on your kitchen table leave it you always leave your door unlocked because nobody would think of wouldn't cross your mind, mind to steal from you that's the society they'd come in they'd make change so you leave say a thousand yen note there and you owed 401 he'd take it leave 600 and leave you your change you go to the bus station. We used to go there. Well, parking was tremendously, I mean, you, you, driving in Japan is, is a true treat, okay? So you go to the train station and you'd leave to, you park your car. Well, it'd, be, it'd always be full. Well, what you do is you just leave your keys in your car. And leave leave them on. on the floor mat. And somebody would come in, they'd move their car to a parking spot. So, you know, your car's in their way. They'd move your car, leave it in and stuff. It'd be yeah. someplace in the parking lot when you got back. You're not really sure where, but they wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't cross their mind to touch your stuff, you know, and I'm, I'm amazed, just a whole, totally different society. Try that at JCCC. Go put your go put your keys in the car, <laughs> walk away for a while. Uh, something something bad is going to happen to you. So very interesting. So again, why do we say those are the best years? Just cause things like that. You know, you th things you just didn't see anywhere. But traveling in Japan was superb, and she got to go to Hong Kong. I got to go to Singapore. Singapore is one of my favorite cities as far as a place to go. I mean, it was a very interesting mm -hmm. city. And uh, we vacationed in Thailand. We vacationed in Thailand. She came down. She came down there at the end of that uh, of, of the Indian Ocean cruise in pa yeah. Thai Beach. And then on the first cruise, when he when we were first married, and um, on the Forestall, you know, we made it through all of Europe pretty much. You know, we met. met I met the ship in France, and then we went over through Italy. <laughs> He's got obviously some story. No, just, just just a little a quick little thing. Mm -hmm. Where do we? Where, where do we? Where the ship almost always pulled into. Naples. Naples. Naples is, was the main Naples. port. And what's the food? And of course, you've been traveling Italy, oh. so. What do you eat in, in, the, in Italy? You eat Italian food. Noodles, pasta, noodles, pasta, and noodles, pasta. And red sauce, red sauce, red, red sauce. sauce. Red sauce, red sauce. So she comes in once, and there it is. Instead of going to a restaurant where we go, we go to the, the USO. USO. And what does the USO have? A big tray of cold cuts. And that's all she watches. <laughs> ham sandwich, ham sandwich. You go, I mean, so, <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you, and you see the wives have been following. They're all there. Thank you, God. Ham sandwich, please. <laughs> Give me some mayonnaise. You know. <laughs> if I the... had to eat one more bowl of pasta, I thought I was just gonna <laughs> just lose it, because while the guys were out, we would always be trying to save money. So we'd always stay in, you know, pensions, and um, we'd eat the chef's special at the restaurant or whatever. And the chef's special was always pasta with red sauce. You know, so after a couple weeks of that, a ham sandwich at the USO was a treat. Well, you got to go to places I didn't get to go because yeah. you got to go to Mon through uh, Monaco and Florence. I mean, you, you were yeah. traveling. Well, she was traveling where I could, you know, we, we would hit Naples. I mean, we got to go down to, like to Terramina and uh, Sorrento and places like and that. Pompeii. And, and Pompeii. But uh, she, uh, you know, she would travel in Europe. Places I didn't get to go, and of course her job now. You talk about why she does it. She gets to travel most of the world. She yeah. gets to travel all so. over. So, so many great and wonderful days in those days that you travel. 
if you don't want me asking what was the worst day for you and what was the worst day for you or maybe it was the same worst day for both of you uh, during traveling during your guys's time together oh I'm trying to think. For me, it's always going to be when one of my friends dies. I mean, I'd have to, you know, you, you don't you don't go over that. I mean, like when when Muff died there, you know, and I I, I keep in touch with Linda, the, you know, his wife. You know, you, you're sitting there, and all of a sudden, one second your friend's there, and the next second your friend is gone, and nothing you can do about it. I mean, just absolutely nothing. I mean, it, things broke. I mean, that that to me is easily, I mean, besides besides types of things, you know, when, when you when somebody in your family, you know, you know, goes away. But I would say, you know, yeah, watch it, watch it, watching a guy get killed off the front of the ship, you know. And he couldn't have done anything about it. I mean, it, just, it was just his day to disappear. And that's all you can do, back, mm -hmm. back up. In fact, the, and it was on the Midway, we only had two forward catapults, that's all they have on that, that class of ship. So they had to fix it, we were at sea, they fixed it. You know, right there at sea. And it's really funny, they were gonna put a, uh, to, to, after they fixed it, you know, they put all, flew all the parts out. We're in the Indian Ocean, middle of nowhere. They get all these massive parts because it just destroyed the catapult, they fixed it. The, uh, we're going to take a catapult shot again now the first time was with an airplane and they the boss really explodes the air boss I'm sorry that's the guy that runs the flight deck he really explodes because uh, they put an E2 the E2 is the big you've seen a propeller plane with a big disc on top well you can't eject out of it okay so if it's not working he screams and yells and gets them off there he wants an ejection seat well guy, I'm flying with a guy named Gino Garrett and Gino they said we'll put two very, we're very experienced they said we'll put them on there on there okay so he shuts it all down they put two, two very experienced guys on there and the catapult officer walks up to us and he goes, he says, he's gonna give us 20 knots of excess in speed. And he's gonna shoot us at a big, a big load. When a, well, I mean, the aircraft, it shoots. And I, I had Gene laugh, halfway down, I could tell Gino, hey Gino, so far, so good. He's such a dying laughing halfway down the storm. But yeah, so that, you know, to, to, to watch a guy get killed like that and then have to go take the first cat shot, well, he got killed. Yeah, it doesn't make you feel good, but it was, you know, that, that, that's the worst for me was, was, that, was that day. I mean, the, the rest of them, you know, could, no, they were they were not permanent damage. You know the, the, that was permanent damage. Losing a friend. Mm -hmm. you know, I and definitely understand that. And then for you, what was your worst day during the active duty time? Probably getting that letter. That really that was one of the worst times. From, from about fatal. About yeah no about here's I'm going to send you this other letter. You know if something happens, and that was for months because I didn't know what was going on. But he was at sea, and. This was hanging over and me. And probably my bad. I didn't tell her that he turned that he turned his wings in afterwards. I didn't tell him that, you know, that the story was over. Yeah. Eh, what do you want? Oh, yeah. A little <laughs> stress relief. No. <laughs> um, that was probably one of the most, you know, that was really bad. Or on the flip side of it, okay, his, this guy was killed on, his wife lived on base with us. So all of a sudden, here's a brand new widow. And the Navy, well. Gets rid of them quickly. Yeah, well, being very nice, it's like, okay, you're a widow. You're going home tomorrow. Pack. You know, and all of a sudden, they're gone. You know, so it was really, that was kind of tough on us, too, because it wasn't that we got to spend a week, you know, comforting and helping and doing what we thought we should because the Navy was sending her home. She, you know, she was out. She was gone. So there, there were things like that that you had to, you know, learn how to get through. Um, there were moments while traveling that, you know, <laughs> you've got a three-month-old in the front and, you know, a 15-month-old in the back and you're trying to, I mean, I actually figured out how to put both of them on me so I could ride the train somewhere, um, <laughs> you Somebody know. Skis pick up his skis in Yokohama, <laughs> seriously. Yeah, <laughs> riding the train with skis, a kid on, but yeah, you, know, you don't get any strange looks there. Uh, and it's summertime. Yeah, it's summertime, because that's when they're on sale. So, um, but you know, traveling with the kids sometimes, uh, one of the most scary moments, only for a couple minutes was, with David, he was always so blonde, and people always, you know, wanted to touch, hold, feel. And so we're waiting down at Hong Kong for news about when the ship was coming in, and somebody was wanting to hold David and hold David. And I turn around, and all of a sudden, he's gone. The lady that's holding him is gone. And I'm freaking out, because I've heard about, you know, people being, children being stolen and everything. 
thankfully she had gone she knew the lady that worked at the next door over and she just wanted to show her this beautiful baby boy but for that you know two minutes when your heart just drops thinking you know i'm in hong kong my husband's out at sea how do i explain that our son has been kidnapped you know it just things like that where you're just like oh my gosh it only lasted a few minutes but there's the there's always those moments where something happens that you're just oh my gosh oh my gosh just catches you by surprise yeah and one of the more <laughs> yeah and one of the more fun trips was he's going to go to sea for a couple months and we know it and I decide I'm not going to stay in Japan. I'm going to go home and visit my family. I haven't seen them in a while. You know, fair, right? Try traveling from Yokosuka, Japan to Virginia Beach by yourself with a 14-month-old and a 5-month-old. We went from Yokosuka to Tokyo, Tokyo to Anchorage, Alaska, Anchorage, Alaska to San Francisco, San Francisco to St. Louis, St. Louis to Atlanta, Atlanta to Virginia Beach. And you get to fly for free till you get to the States. Till you get to the States. And then it was, but that. Because you can go space available. Yeah. But that took, I'm thinking a little over 24 hours. And by that point, you've, you've run out of bottles for the little one because milk doesn't last that long, it spoils. It doesn't matter how many diapers you took with you, you've gone through every single one of them. You now have two very cranky, very angry kids, and you're just like, <laughs> you know, just on edge. And you go to get on your next flight, and the guy goes, can't you keep your kids quiet? You know, and you're just like, buddy, you have to. <laughs> you know. you're lucky we can't conceal carry. <laughs> <laughs> Different you know, laws back then. <laughs> I'm just trying to get home. And, you know, thankfully, my father was a travel agent. He actually flew down to Atlanta and met me there with bottles and diapers and <laughs> you know and help me get back to Virginia Beach because I was just yeah. you know like this trying to trying to travel by myself with those kids on the way back I actually met up with another wife in Chicago and we then made it out to San Francisco put our name on the space a list and she had um, her in-laws actually lived in the San Francisco area so they let us stay with them for a couple days while we were waiting for the space a flights back but the biggest thing it was somebody else, another set of hands, because just traveling with children that little by yourself with, you know, no word from your husband and, you know. How's it, how's it see? <laughs> I never came, uh, during the time in Japan, I never came, I never came back to the States. I just yeah. stayed there the whole three years. Yeah. And I just, you know, because my family was in Japan, you know, and I, I, I'd go see my parents' family, but, you know, that's fine. I just stay with my wife and kids because... Again, that travel we made. I did that one. T I did going that over, one time. I did over there, and on the way over, David was a newborn. He was sick as he could be, traveling over, just miserable. And I said, "I'm not doing that again." You know, one time yeah. is enough. Go, just go, go back to the states when it's time to get back. Yeah, when we actually traveled to Japan, you had strep throat and he had an ear infection. Yeah, so we. So were both, uh, we were in really great shape when we landed. You know, after. <laughs> yeah, it was an ominous beginning. <laughs> to say the least there. But it ended up working yeah. to be the best. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Um, as we start to wrap up, is there anything that you feel like you would like to share that you haven't shared yet? Mm. There's, I know there's quite a few stories. I can tell story after story, but you know. Is there one that sticks out the most that you want to make sure to? Well, I don't know. I told the you know the, the the two ones that were there were most the getting shot down and the, you know that that's always I've always told them that that's that's a, that's a big story the uh, yeah I think maybe when I retired probably one of the few times I've ever lost it remember that because my father was very very proud that I joined the Navy okay and he died about three about five months before I retired and at my retirement ceremony when they were doing I, I just broke down in tears. And my mother was there, and I was talking about him, and you know, just lost, kind of, kind of lost it there. Yeah, because he was always, he was a veteran. He was so proud that his son was a veteran. I definitely can understand. But the best part is, you made him proud. Yeah. Well, you did. I just joined the Navy. <laughs> I just you wanted to, all I wanted was to go fly fighters. You know, and when, 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 when that was over, it was over. It was, it got, it, got, it, it turned, once it turned an eight to five hammer and egg job, it was an eight to five hammer and egg job. And that was, 
That's why I got. That's why I couldn't go any further than go back to go back to doing it again. And once the flying was over, the fun was over. Mm -hmm. I can understand that, especially yeah. with the amazing stories and yeah. the amazing patches and the me the experiences. Yeah. So now I've got to go fly my airplane <laughs> and take her with me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we go see old Navy friends yeah. and tell, tell these same stories over and over and over again. For God's sake, get some new stories. <laughs> we, in fact, if with that one reunion we just had, it was interesting how many uh, oh, of, the, of, the, of the second generation is flying. In fact, uh, a guy named, uh, he's, he's now, he, his parents are upset about it. He, uh, a guy, a very, very close friend of mine, I, I use John name, John yeah. Kowalczyk. And again, a very close friend. He and I, Pope and I, his call sign is Pope, because you know, at the time, the Pope was, at the time was uh, Polish, so Kowalczyk, Pope. Yeah. Anyway, his son, Dan, uh, went on to become an able flight officer like I was, and so I, he's, he's wearing my wings. Yeah, I went down and put my wings, gave them to him at his wing ceremony. And now, and, and then he wanted to do a career, but his, uh, he, he married a young lady who didn't like him being in the Navy, so he got out, and his wife, Dan's mother and father are livid. <laughs> As you can imagine, you know, but it, that, that's one of the prouder things, taking my wings and passing them on to another generation. And, and just, you know, seeing the generations being passed on, you know, the, uh, the number of people at our last reunion. And once, once we've been out of the military, as the guys have gotten older, they've realized, you know, that they really do need to see each other more often. So we've been doing more reunions and uh, getting together with everybody. And it's interesting seeing how many of the guys actually have their children who have joined various branches of the military and carried on the tradition that way. So uh, it's, it's very, it's been an interesting life. For, for the group in, via, in, in Japan, both BF 151 and 161, I do a thing, I do it this morning too, it's called Phantom Friday. I send out, a, I, I send out an email, either a stupid joke or a super story. And the joke is always set in Japan. You know, we talk about a uh, you know, something we all remember, and at the end of it is a stupid joke. It's always a, you know, a really bad jokes too, by the way. I mean, they, they make you throw up. They're so bad. Or I send a picture like today was just a, a video of uh, some flight ops off a carrier, part of the, of the ship really moving and stuff. But uh, we keep in touch, and I'll send one of those out, and I'll get 30 or 40 responses at times. You know, yeah. hey, people, what do they, they want to be 20 again, 25? You know, they're not. We're all we're all pushing 70 now, but you, you should like to be 30 again, you know. And and, and flying jets going there I was. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there I was, flat on my back, out of airspeed. Why did you shoot? Well, this was me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Um, God, this I wish this could be for four or five hours, and of course included lunch somewhere in there. Um, but thank you so much. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your stories. And just thank you for being open and truly just sharing what no one else could share. Because from your perspective, again, you too served. That's such a unique perspective. Because like you said, wonderful young man, but the his wife didn't want him in anymore. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and that happened a lot. Um, when we were living in Japan, my neighbor came over and she gave me this keychain that I really admired of hers. It was a big brass plate that said Navy wife on it. And she said, oh, here, you know, here's the keys to my house. I want you to have this. And I didn't think anything of it. She was leaving. She couldn't, she couldn't do it anymore. She was just flat out leaving. And there were a lot, there were several couples that I know of that it was like, it's me or the Navy. You know, you had to make a choice. And what a choice that is to do. Um, so, you know, kudos to everybody that does stay together, but it is, it does require strength from everybody to, to make it work long term. Well, I'll tell you something. When it takes a Navy career, behind every successful Naval officer, there's a wife rolling her eyes. <laughs> yep, <laughs> that's about the truth. Because <laughs> through the years and the beers, the stories get better. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, baby. <laughs> mm.